Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Rutherford County School Board meeting for January the 5th. First item on the list is uh, Pledge of Allegiance, Board Member Lisa Moore. <clears throat> I'd like to ask everybody to join us in a moment of silence. Uh, I'd like to everyone to remember the Baylor Bramble family. Uh, they suffered that loss this week, and uh, if you would just please keep them in your prayers. Thank you. All right, next item, approval of the agenda. We do need to shuffle a couple things around. Uh, we will be needing to get a couple of people out of here so they can get to other meetings. So we did move up the uh, Plainview rezoning and the Sam Davis home. So um, there's no objections there. I do need a, a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Estes. Do I have a second? Ms. Braddon, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, next item is uh, approval of the consent agenda. <coughs> I have a motion. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Second, Ms. Maxwell, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. We're going to do the visitors now, or we're going to wait till afterwards. Uh, we need to go get to number seven, I think, uh, out of the way. Shane? Okay, before Shane gets started, I uh, just want to say that he's going to go over. We had two, two maps that we've already looked at, and a third one that was sent out, I think, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what we're going to do is look at all three of them again, and it, it would be my uh, request that we would hold an open uh, special call meeting for rezoning on February the 19th. Good evening. Uh, in November, we brought you a plan from the staff. Uh, our recommendation to you is basically shown up on the screen now. Um, to uh, take Rockvale, Christiana, Barfield, and Buchanan Elementary Schools and um, move some things around, some subdivisions around, so that we made room for the brand new Plainview Elementary School. Um, do you want me to go over the actual numbers or? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, after we moved the, the items around that we chose, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to read you on that first one. Are you starting from how, what order are you starting with? Number one. Okay. So in plan one, we would have ended up with Rockvale at 802, Barfield at 691, Christiana at 588, Buchanan at 441, and Plainview at 526. The big changes in that, in that area, and we're going to revisit the same areas over and over again. They're the ones that were in the most contention. They're in the biggest uh, density in the county or in this area of the county. So they're the ones that need to shift around so that we can make room. So basically, what we tried to do with Rockvale to relieve the pressure off of it was take the area that's north of Veterans Parkway and uh, somewhat e southeast of uh, Highway 99 and shift that into Barfield. At that time, we were taking everything on in that triangular section. Just south of Barfield, we were looking at taking part of Rockvale that exists in 
uh, this little nook here. And we were moving about 50 uh, some students from Rockvale again into Barfield. And the south, uh, south side of that little nodule, we were taking about another 55 and pulling them into Christiana. The biggest point of contention for this particular plan was the uh, Indian Hills and Savannah Ridge subdivisions. Although that moved a large number of students, um, over 100, from Barfield into Plainview, giving us a bigger starting uh, base for Plainview Elementary School, it was decided that we needed to maybe look at some different options for those two areas. We also, because now the Summersby um, subdivision was disjointed from um, Barfield, there was no way to add them back um, without going basically through two zones to get back to Barfield. So we chose to move them down into uh, Buchanan Elementary School. And for Plainview to exist with this plan, we are again, were originally taking the Indian Hills, um, Savannah Ridge areas, half, basically half of Christiana Elementary School and half of Buchanan, and all that combined would make Plainview. Any questions? 121 out of Barfield on that on that plan was that is that correct? That, that's true. Okay. So then we moved to Plan Two after discussion uh, internally and also with the public and you know, working on their their feedback. We made some adjustments to that original plan. So option two was to take instead of taking all 120 so that live in this, again, this area uh, south of 99 and north of, um, north of Veterans Parkway, we chose to take half of it. Uh, the other half would go to Barfield. Uh, we then, based on the recommendations from the public and uh, your concerns, uh, we moved Indian Hills and Savannah Ridge back into Barfield. We left Summersby at, um, Buchanan Elementary School, and the entire area uh, was decided at that point to move into Christiana. That is that again, that little nodule. So that would have added about a hundred into Christiana. The makeup of Plainview was basically the same as Plan One, with the exception of Savannah Ridge and Indian Hills. Those numbers play out. So we increased Rockvale back to 857. We um, increased Barfield to 706, and we increased Christiana to 648. And it's just the way that everything kind of moved around. Um, and Buchanan uh, stayed the same, and Plainview decreased to 396. Yeah, that's correct. And one of the things when we looked at this plan here, that was one of the reasons, why, I mean, several reasons, but one of it was to allow for growth for the new school. Yes, uh, we know that there's a lot of homes coming online out there. And Mr. Lee, you've, you spoke on that. You want to speak a little bit about what's going on out there? There's, there's two or three large subdivisions that have either gone through the county or coming through the city that are waiting on the CUD water line extension upgrade before they break ground and go ahead because they don't have the water pressure for fire hydrants. That uh, CUD is probably about seven months to a year away from having that complete. They're completed past us now. So once all that gets taken care of, those subdivisions will be getting started. They're fairly large. One of the challenges on uh, rezoning is obviously moving kids it's, that's been established in places. But another challenge is making sure that you don't over fill the new school up. Uh, quite frankly, we've, we've had some challenges here in the last couple of years, uh, not only with Rockville High, uh, but also with Rocky Fork Elementary. And a lot of times, and, and I get it, we want, and we've always stated, the board has always stated, they want students out of those portables. And I agree with it. Uh, but sometimes we put too many in that other new school, and the growth that he's uh, describing comes and, and overcrowds it in within three to five years. 
And that's another point too. It's not only the master plans for the subdivisions that are currently out there. Um, the Canyon Estates, for example, is a giant subdivision. And it's the master plan for it is really only half built out right now. Uh, there are several little tentacles that go off the edges of that subdivision. Um, but the other thing to pay attention to is if any of yourselves or the public has gone out there to kind of see what's going on with the school, you'll notice that overnight, all those farms <laughs> started going up for sale. Um, that is telltale that we're getting ready to explode in that area within, you know, within a, a good amount of time, but still, you know, five to seven years, it's not going to be the same place it is now. When we looked at this also, we, uh, and Dr. Sullivan uh, had his men put, when we looked at Rockville Ele uh, Elementary School, we noticed that, that, that in this map here, we, we really have not relieved them as much as we should. Now, I used this term a couple of years ago that I'm not going to use, mature neighborhood, okay? Build out, okay? Barfield is a pretty stable zone the where it is currently. And, uh, it, you know, I, I think since New Salem opened for the city, we the uh, last two years it's pretty much stayed the same. There hasn't been any growth in there. And, it, and it's not because it has some established neighborhoods uh, they're not going to build. So on the third option, uh, we looked at how can we relieve some of Rockvale uh, at the same time perhaps maybe moving more to, uh, to back to Barfield. So you want to go with that now? Yeah, so the, the key to that was moving back to the original plan for that area. Um, we chose to, again, go back and dig deeper um, into that corner of um, 99 and uh, Veterans Parkway. That was a, one way we were going to be ensured that we got as much of the density out of Rockvale as we po possibly could in an area that wasn't going to change as much. One thing to pay attention to when you're going down Veterans Parkway towards um, New Salem Highway, um, you'll, you'll notice that to the right or the north side, most of the subdivisions that are out there are under construction but built more fully. The ones to the south or to the left as you're headed towards New Salem are, there's still foundations with, with utility stubs hanging out of them. You know that there's gonna to continue to be massive growth in those areas. The fire station is still not surrounded by homes yet, um, but there's a lot of land that's tailored to easy build out there. So you, you ready for me to go over those numbers? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So uh, basically how that changes is we were able to drop Rockville back down to almost 800, which is a great number for them. Uh, Barfield came up to 813, Buchanan stayed the same, Plainview stayed the same, and we kind of split the difference between that area again um, and gave Barfield half and um, Christiana half, kind of splitting it, it literally 50-50 kids. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Morgan, thank you. I know this is a, a lot of hard work that goes into this. Um, I guess my question is, when you look at um, the third option that we've got, with Rockvale and Barfield, of course, we're still like over 800 students. You may need to refresh my memory kind of what the capacity for each of these schools sure. is. I mean, I understand the whole philosophy behind saving room at the new school mm -hmm. because of the new um, development that we see in the plans coming up. Just want to make sure we're not cutting ourselves short on the same thing, you know, with Barfield and Rockvale. Right. Being over 800, that may be that they're built for a much bigger capacity, say, than Buchanan, but um, I just like So to... our current capacities for those particular schools, <clears throat> and these capacities were given to me by Trey around October, end of October, um, and I want you to understand, too, this is, these capacities are somewhat of a moving target. They're set by the federal government and it's per uh, square footage per student, correct? Yes, and you also have to take into account the demographic, so it kind of changes from year to year, so we kind of use an average, um, and it does not take into account portables. This is brick and mortar building only. And your grade bands is primarily what you're talking about, with well, your K yes. through five. Uh, I mean, a 
per pupil per classroom. Barfield is the one I go back to say several times. It's the one that is, we have not seen growth. Be, there's a reason why, because of Salem opening up, haven't seen growth. With Rockville Elementary, even with this rezoning, it's going to be need to be addressed in, in probably less than three years. One of the things that uh, Mr. Uh, Lee's going to talk about, you go ahead and talk about what the plan in our, uh, that we'll be bringing to the board with our building program. Yeah, we've taken a hard look at our five-year building program. And with those of you that are in the Rockville area, uh, across from the Dollar General, there's three large subdivisions coming right out there by the school. And they're broke ground and they're coming fast. Um, we, through zoning, are limited to what we can move out of that school zone because it's a large zone, but it's not very dense. The density is more toward in town, as, I, as Shane's alluded to, in that one little pocket is where the density is. The rest of it's pretty spread out. But the density is coming to Rockville and it's coming right on top of it. It's going to be the problem. We can't get enough kids out of Rockville Elementary with this rezoning to get it to where we're going to buy ourselves three to five years. It's, it's not, there's not enough densely packed subdivisions there to get them out. So we're kind of looking at a, a, a two year deal. Let's get enough children out of there and can now that the, we have that school on the sewer, uh, there's some acreage there beside us that, that were, was tied up with the sewer system that's no longer there. And we're looking at the possibility of doing like we did at Rock Springs Elementary and building an annex. And that's what we're gonna be coming to you fairly soon with our new building program. Um, because it, it, the problem is you just can't get enough kids out of Rockville. No matter how Shane slices it, you just can't get enough out. So it, that's literally the further south you go in anywhere in the county or to the um, east, east, anywhere in there, is the further you go out and it doesn't take too far to go, the numbers just drop off. I mean, people <clears> just don't exist out there. there it, it's not good land to build on in some cases. Um, so, to answer the question about um, the capacities, Thank you. right now, um, Barfield sits at around 870. The cannon would be 460. Christiana is about 730. Rockvale is about 870. And I assume that Plainview is going to be somewhere between 850 and 1000. Let me jump in real quick because I, I, these numbers remind me of two years ago, prior to Salem opening up. Uh, if we'll go back and look prior to them opening up, Rock, uh, excuse me, Barfield was almost at 1,000. There was one portable, and the portable was used by the uh, 504 coordinator. That's right. So my, my, I think with our, when we start talking about capacity, we, you know, I think, I, and I get what we're doing, but we got to be... You know, that once was a, uh, you know, a K-8 school. It's very fluid. Yeah. That number is there. That's what I'm saying. It's very fluid. So I, I recall that was one of our biggest concerns in 2018, what we were going to do. But we didn't anticipate that Salem would have that great of an impact on them. And, and that alleviated a lot of that. And, and for the last two years, we haven't seen that kind of growth come back that way. Yeah, not right there. I mean, no. Barfield is the nucleus of that school is the nucleus of that zone, and it is very densely packed. And this plan, um, again, is intended to eliminate our portables at, at uh, Buchanan, correct? Buchanan. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So before the um, the four forty one numbers at Buchanan, where, where are we now before the proposed changes? Um, at, at the moment, we're sitting right at about 515. Right. Okay. So it, we have reduction to eliminate those portables? Uh, that's something we've been promising Buchanan for, know, promising, but telling them to take care of it. They will be right at their capacity with that number without portables. And so any growth in subdivision 
we would either have to get rid of a configuration that they're serving small groups right now or have to build something back. We don't have any room to build on there, do we? No, but they have some smaller classrooms that they're using right now for some of their ESL, RTI, and SPED that at one point were a larger classroom. Okay. And, and two things to remember also in that is that Buchanan Estates, again, is going to another school. And the other big thing is that the um, subdivision across the street, what is that one called? The Maples. Maples. Um, is not building out anywhere near as fast as they had, had proposed for it to build out. Right? That's a very slow mover. It's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's difficult when you're using, when you're using this as a, as a, a part of the, was it I-24, is that what you're using? Yes, sir, it is. It's kind of difficult because we do know that, you know, that, that, that's, that's a challenge. For, but my question for the board, would there be any entertaining of anyone that's at in, uh, Buck Cannon for zoning, that could zone exempt to Plainview? I mean, I, I, mean we've, I don't know if we've ever done anything like that before. You know, that, that, that really is a really good question because when you look at, this is not a situation with Buchanan and Plainview so much as the, the whole concern with other areas about, hey, we're going to have to drive by our school or we're driving 15 miles now instead of three miles. I mean, they're so closely and so right. tightly packed. I think that. I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't think, think we've ever done that, but I'm just saying that would be something that I guess the board could vote on and later on and, and allow that. Yeah. And you may have some parents that mm -hmm. would rather send their kids to the new schools. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. And, and I have heard public comment in, in light of that, you know, that, that are saying, you know, we're going to be over by there, but we're not going to be, according to the, zone, uh, the zoning that you've given us, we're not going to have that now. It's only been a few, but if you were to put it out there, it may be a very popular suggestion. Yeah. Well, if I'm not mistaken, when you talk about Buchanan Estates, the location, they can actually get to Plainview in a more direct manner than they can to Buchanan because they don't have to get out on Manchester Pike. I have now driven it right. several times myself, and there are three different routes in and out of that neighborhood to right. that school. Okay. So they, they have lots of different options. That might be worth exploring. Yeah. And Mr. Spell, to, to that question, um, just in opening Rocky Fork Middle School, our zone was not fully um, open yet, and I think we were projected to open at about 500, and we did allow zone exemptions because we were not a full yeah. campus. So I mean, good. yeah. Okay. And it was several hundred that we accepted. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. We will be getting back together on February the 19th. 19th. For a special call rezoning. Is that the date then? February, February 19th. <laughs> And that'll be a public meeting here with right. parents still having the option to attend. Right. Okay, moving on to uh, number eight, uh, Sam Davis home. All right, there was a lengthy discussion and information given on the Sam Davis home dam removal on the De December 17, 2020 uh, board meeting, at which time there was a motion made to table this until this meeting here. So at this time, uh, the board's meeting is going to discuss the Army Corps engineers that made the decision. And the motion is to approve the request to move the dam at no cost to the Rutherford County Schools or the school board after approval by the United States Army Corps of Engineers as presented. All right. Open it up for any discussion. Mr. Chairman, there seemed to be some confusion um, or some lack of information last time in our last meeting. So uh, I went and visited the site. I brought some photos for those board members who didn't get an opportunity to visit the site um, to put an a, a image with our conversation here. Also, uh, Commissioner Reed is here uh, and may be able to answer any questions or give us some um, information. He serves on the uh, Board of Trustees there at the Sam Davis Memorial Association. So maybe you can come up, Commissioner, and talk with us a little bit so we can clarify this and move out of it. Hello, Commissioner Reed. Mr. Chairman, board members, 
good to be here with you this evening, and and it is a pleasure to be here with you before uh, this board. Uh, Education is right, right important to me. It's always been important to my family. Uh, I had a father who drove a school bus for 46 years, and mother was manager of the Rockville cafeteria for 36. My uncle was principal out there at Rockville for 35 years, and no, I did not become a teacher. Uh, my brother and sister did, but I didn't. I went into agriculture, and I worked for Tennessee Farm Bureau for 44 years. But tonight, I. I am a county commissioner in the Rockville area, and I appreciate what you're doing there. I have a grandson who is a kindergartner at Rockville Elementary, and I appreciate what you're doing. But tonight I come to you as a trustee of the Sam Davis Memorial Association. Uh, there are other trustees here, as well as the president of the board out there, to become a trustee of that uh, association out there. You have to be appointed and you're appointed by the governor of the state of Tennessee. And we go through a background check. We are interviewed by the staff of the governor who is in seat at that time. Uh, governor Haslam has appointed me twice to uh, the trustee out there. So we take it very seriously what we do. And when you're talking about what we're suggesting here as far as this dam is concerned that you see there, this all started back uh, all the way back to 2014 when we had our concerns about this dam. And we began discussing it sort of around 2015, uh, about the time I, I became a trustee in 2014. My term expires in 2022. But our concerns was that the dam is starting to become breached over on the school board property over that way. But we were also seeing a lot of uh, situations where we'd have nylon ropes that would come from the trees where individuals would swing from your property walking across that dam uh, coming over to the Sam Davis home, which uh, that shows you some of the breach that's there right now. But you can see these are trail cameras that were set up to uh, see what was happening when we wasn't there where individuals would come from the properties over to the Sam Davis property. So it, it sort of jeopardizes our um, safety for the property over there, but it also jeopardizes the safety of what goes on around that, that area right there where the dam is located. That dam was built in 1939. It was not built during the time that the Davis family was there in which the uh, Sam Davis uh, Memorial Association portrays there on the property today. We're portraying the, the lives of Charles Davis, who was the father of Sam, and the farm is what it was in the 1860s when Sam was there. Uh, we, we do what you might say a living history at times. We have days on the farm and heritage days, and if you happen to come out there for those in the spring and the summer, you'll see me somewhat dressed up like Charles Davis. And I'm teaching children about how food is cured, uh, what farming was like back then. I answer their questions about the different families that lived on that farm. And I also talk about Stewart Creek and what goes on down there. But what we were looking at from that period of time to today is the dangers of that dam. We're concerned about what's happening. And if I had to answer, no, we do not know of anyone that has drowned it there or anything happening, but we do know of instances where kayaks have been caught in that breach. We know where individuals have been caught in whirlpools down there, and we just wonder when the time's going to happen. So we're concerned about that due to the breaches there. The reason you have the breach that's in the dam on the far side over there, at that time when they built dams, they put water ports in those dams at the bottom. The reason you place a water port in a dam like that is due to the fact that you have to relieve the stress on the dam. Anybody that just has any common sense about this is that these ports are in the bottom. You've got to have a little bit of water passing through so you remove the stress from the dam. What's happened is on that far side, those ports have been come, become clogged, and it had to go somewhere. The pressure had to go somewhere. So it blew out that side over there, and what we've got, as you saw that picture a while ago in that wide space, is that there is a quite a bit of erosion happening on that far side, which is affecting the environmental situation that we have there. Well, if you have ever dealt with volunteer organizations and nonprofit organizations, 
the availability of funds and money is not there. It's sort of like the school board here. We have to watch every penny and what we do there. And I'm serving on county commission. I know when you come before us and, and what we do talking about our schools, we have to watch those funds. We didn't know how this could be fixed or what we could do and how it could be removed. But due to a meeting, we run across the Cumberland River Compact Group. Uh, the Cumberland River Compact Group has been in operation since the 90s. They uh, have taken out a lot of these uh, low head dams across the state of Tennessee. And if you'll talk to the Corps of Engineers, they are doing this everywhere because of the concerns with these dams. If they're not in use, if they don't serve a purpose, they try to remove those basically because of environmental and safety reasons. Uh, I've talked to Chris Clark, our Director of Public Safety. He has told me he would like to see this one removed too because of the safety uh, environment that we have with this dam right here. Not only the fact of the breach that we have and the dangers of this old dam, but also of that too. So as we talked with the Cumberland River Compact, they, they actually made an offer to us that they would take it out for us. And they have taken out several dams all across the state, as I've said before. They're a nonprofit organization that does this. They're an environmental group that does this. The thing that caught our attention or made our ears perked up is that they would do this with no cost to the Sam Davis Association as well as the county taxpayers. That they would take care of what would be necessary to do that. And in any environmental um, loss or any environmental wetlands or anything across uh, the nation today, you have to go through a system. I think there's about nine different agencies to get permits to do something like this, to repair or remove, to do this, which means it's quite expensive. And to do it, there's a process that was set in motion all the way back to 1977 when they set this process, and it's called using mitigation banking. And that all began back when the term environmental began for us, back in, uh, all the way back to 1973. The reason I knew a little bit about this is the fact that I said I work for a Farm Bureau. Uh, when you say Farm Bureau, if you work for Farm Bureau, all people immediately think you work for the insurance company. I didn't. I worked for the Tennessee Farm Bureau Federation. I worked in the area of communications and legislation. So mitigation, we had a lot of farmers where this all really began, where we had farmers that had wetlands and they needed to do something with them. Uh, in other words, it was taking over their farms. Well, to do that, they had to come up with a way to say, hey, can I fill in that wetland and what was going on in the United States at that time from the 70s all the way up to the 90s is no, the government said you can't do that. Uh, we got to save our wetlands, and I'm sure you've all heard that. That's how a lot of this was being done. So they come up with this concept back in 1993, a mitigation banking is where you would bank credits. In other words, if you've got a development, if you've got a farm or something, you want to take care of these wetlands, or in other words, place wetlands somewhere else or take care of environmental issues, the way to pay for it is that you would buy credits giving you the ability to take care of your projects, such in a development, and then the environmental issues would be taken care of. And that's what we're doing right here. The Cumberland River Compact is one of the better organizations in the United States that does this. And I'm not just saying that because we're dealing with them. I went about checking on them. If any of you know of the Burgess property that is getting ready to be developed over here on Highway 96, I also served on the Rutherford County Planning Commission. And we just recently approved that project over there. And when they come to us, they have on that piece of property right there 37 acres of wetlands. And we wondered how in the world they were going to take care of those wetlands. Well, they brought out their plan. And they're taking care of their own mitigation banking themselves. What happened is the Corps of Engineers come in there, TDEC come in there, and they saw the way that they were going to do it. They're building their own environmental wetlands with different types of plants and things that they allowed them to go about creating their own mitigation bank out there on the Burgess property. 
But when they got through, I asked how the individuals that's going to create that environmental uh, plan out there, what they knew about the Cumberland River Compact. And they immediately told me, said, we work with them all the time, and they're one of the best in the nation to do this type of thing. And said, whatever they tell you, you can, you can basically go to the bank with them. So what will happen is that I think about I think last year around March or so, they put up the call for mitigation uh, credits to be banked or people to buy into it to place their credits. What they will do is once they get the amount of funds that they need and collect, they'll go in here, remove this dam, and then that is all banked, and then that is kept basically to take care of the environmental issue. Because once you remove the dam, you still have to deal with, you saw that, that little, large picture of the breach there and what has been done as far as the erosion. They have to work with that entire embankment as well as all of, on both sides, all the way down Stewart's Creek where it has been affected. And they have to watch that for a number of years. It's just not walked off and left. If you know anything about the environment, what we are dealing with, as far as streams, uh, Stewart's Creek's out here, there are a lot of developments on it that you can't even cut a tree that has fallen into that creek without time contacting the Corps of Engineers. So this is very important that it's done correctly and done properly. So that is what uh, this is all about. Now, something that you need to understand, I think we show to you a, uh, a uh, little contract there in the way that what funds are remaining after the project is done they would be divided up. They'll be divided up, I think, 33, 33, 34. 34% uh, 34 going to the Sam Davis Memorial Association, 33 to uh, the school board, and then 33, I think, goes to the Cumberland River Compact. The thing we have learned recently, and I had never heard of this, and I've talked to several individuals that have worked with this. I even contacted uh, the gentleman at the Farm Bureau that is continually dealing with this on a daily basis, he said, I have never heard of any money given back before, given back to property owners. And the reason that it is being given back is the fact, this is probably one of the first time you've seen two nonprofit organizations working together. And that's the reason this is all happening because this is totally nonprofit uh, that is trying to accomplish this and they're gonna return that back to to the different groups as well as there's a school involved in it too. So that's primarily what's behind all of this. Uh, our primary goal behind all of this is safety. Uh, that's a very old dam. That is a, a low head uh, dam, which uh, as I've said before, they're trying to remove as many of those as possible. Historically, uh, we can't find anything in the minutes or the records of the uh, Sam Davis Association that makes it historically. It was built, like I said, in 1939. We've gone through the minutes. In fact, when they built this dam, they did not record that they were building a dam, I think, until 1940. Uh, they forgot to put it in the minutes. And it was primarily what we understand, and it was only by word of mouth that they built it for a reflecting pool because the ladies were very much involved in planting a lot of flowers uh, in that area, and they wanted it as a reflecting pool. Well, about the only thing it's going to reflect right now is cattails and uh, goldenrod and that sort of thing, because that's all that grows around Stewart's Creek at this time. And uh, that, that's primarily it. Uh, I think your engineer recommended that you go ahead and remove it for the safety of the school that is joining this property. Uh, I would say that too. Uh, no, uh, I think it's been reported to you. We have no record of anyone losing life there or being hurt. But it reminds me on my own property there, I've got a lot of tall trees. And whenever there gets to be a dead limb up there, we always call those widow makers. And we always take them out because you never know when it's going to fall. And, uh, and what I'm saying here, I do not want to be the one responsible that when something does happen there, they said you didn't do anything. So that's the information I have as far as, uh, and I think uh, Board Member Johnson, is that pretty well what I could 
Do you have you? Unless there's any other questions. I, there were some questions at our last meeting, so I appreciate you being here. Well, I appreciate you moving me up here because I've got another county commission meeting to head off to tonight. Uh, we're trying to take care of some things out at Rockvale. So. Could I, could I ask a question? There's no guarantee that there's going to be money left over after the seven years. It's like anything. Um, we think there will be. In fact, we think there will be more money uh, uh, available uh, than what is being shown here. We just don't know because they will be using it along there. But now, uh, what they're projecting, yes, there will be. But um, like I said, we, we've never heard of this before, of money even being given back. But what the thing you've got to look at, uh, you don't have to spend any money at all to have it done anyway. And uh, if you look at the damage on this dam, it's not on the Sam Davis home property. It's on the school board property. It's where the damage is at. And to repair that, I know somebody has said you might want to repair it. The repair uh, bill would cost uh, probably more than what tearing it down would be. And uh, plus it'll be a considerable amount because you've got to go by the Corps of Engineers standards. You've got to go by TDEC standards and you've got to go through those nine agencies to get that done. Because you can't touch a stream anymore like you used to. You can't even drive a tractor across one like you used to. But no, if I had to sit here and tell you how much, no, I can't. Anybody else? Mr. Lee, do we know, uh, do we have an estimate on when the Corps of Engineers may be rendering a decision? Well, uh, I'll, get, I'll answer your question. I'll just step way. down and let y'all talk. I'll answer your question this way. We've been working with them at Plainview for over six months, and I still don't have an answer from them there. Um, it could be tomorrow. It could be three months from now. This gentleman may have some... They, they did not give me a time frame. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thanks for that question. I'll be brief. I'm Steve Murphy, the SDMA president. Um, I, I learned from the Cumberland River Compact um, yesterday that the Army Corps of Engineers expects a decision either tomorrow, Thursday, or Friday of this week. Any other questions? We'd recognize some of our trustees who are here and directors of our association, uh, uh, Ms. Beth Finkley, um, Margie Weatherford, and then uh, Toby Francis. Toby's a long-term member of the Stones River Watershed Association. He brought some additional photographs of the dam and the breach. And um, he, of course, all of us have voted to have the dam removed if, if at all possible. Thank you. Are there any other discussion? Board members? Chairman, I have a question. Yes, sir, if you, if you can make it pretty quick. We've got a long agenda tonight, so if you come on up and uh, speak real quick, yes, sir. Uh, I am uh, Toby Francis. Uh, I w I've been on uh, been on the board at the uh, at the Historical Society, and also out of Sam Davis Home, and also the uh, Stones River Watershed. Uh, I did bring across some pictures. The picture that you were looking at uh, there showed a lot of water, and it was clear water. It it, it looked relatively clear. Um, Having grown up, uh, I was born before the dam was actually built. And, uh, and Ernie Johns, uh, he told me that his, his father was the one who was contracted originally. There was an there was an article in the paper in the, on the, on the internet today, and I'm not sure that that was correct. But, uh, his father, Mr. Frank Johns, was the one who was actually contracted to build the dam. And so, uh, the pictures that I have here, are taken at a different time of the year when, uh, uh, to me, the, uh, the most beautiful time of the year is when the water is blowing, uh, is actually flowing. Um, as far as, as uh, 
I own, some, I own quite a, uh, a stretch of land uh, farther up to, up to Stewart's Creek, uh, right across from the high school, uh, the Smyrna High School. And so uh, I grew up on, uh, on the Stones River down, uh, down from, the, from the, where uh, Stewart's Creek comes in. I lived upstream from that on, uh, uh, on a land grant uh, that, uh, that dated way back. And so um, um, I spent some joyous times living on the river. I'm a, I was a teacher for 37 half years and worked at Boeing Aircraft, went out, uh, went out west, traveled around the country. And uh, so I've been back here uh, since 1968. And uh, I taught it both at Smyrna and Thurman Francis, who was my, my father's younger brother. And uh, I taught at uh, Old Central the last year that was there, and then I went to Oakland High School, and I spent some joyous years, joyous years. I spent the last 20 years teaching all Latin, and um, had great students. It's just, um, uh, and then having grown up on a, on a farm that's on the river, probably no, no better place on the face of the earth was that bend of the river the part of the river that I grew up on was if you're on Jefferson Pike looking downstream uh, at the water pumping station, it was built in 42 at the Air Force Base to pump, uh, to pump water over to the base. And then down past that, in that land grant that was 1,828 acres, um, there was a section where the, where the river uh, uh, bends off to the east and Fall Creek comes in, Spring Creek comes in, and then turns straight west and goes uh, uh, straight to a big bluff and then on down toward Faith Sanders Bridge. Now that, uh, our farm that we owned, uh, that I grew up on, uh, was in that big bend, and old, old deeds call it the big bend of the Sto Stones River. Um, so, uh, so I spent years there, and, uh, and, um, and so um, I, I treasure those, those times on Stewart Creek. Now, I, I did want to show you some pictures, uh, of these pictures that I've taken of the dam. Um, it shows it uh, uh, from the time of the year uh, when, when the water is down. And so there's a, uh, the water becomes much more stagnant. I'll just kind of go around this way. If you look up in the upper, upper corner up there, this is upstream from the dam, and you see that pile of trash right there uh, on the far side. I, uh, I took the picture from down, down below the dam and, and looking back up, and, uh, and there, when the water goes down, there's, there's one hole that comes right through there where, uh, where you can tell it's almost completely black. And, and because of the uh, conditions of the, of, the, uh, of the dead of summer, dry, the drought area, uh, it is, uh, it's not a pleasant place to be. It, there's, uh, it catches a lot of trash. Now, uh, to me, my experience is, and the saddest part is when I take a, a hike, either down Stewart's Creek or down Stones River from where I grew up, is the, is the amount of plastic and trash. It's massive trash, and, and down in the Bender River, there's very, uh, a very little cleanup at all. And, and in recent days, when we had these recent floods, we'd, uh, the, uh, 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 the creek has uh, actually widened. Uh, I've owned this area uh, where I live off of Bel Air. Uh, I've, I've got 27 and a half acres there now. And so, so trees fall in and all the plastic, uh, it's amazing how much growth that Rutherford County, and you deal with this, I, I uh, talk with uh, uh, people who are here, and uh, and dealing with the uh, the uh, the amount of people who now live in in Rutherford County, there's massive passing. Just a few days ago, there was a tree that had fallen down, blocked the uh, blocked the uh, the uh, creek on my property, and there was just a mass of plastic. Just uh, and the same thing is true over the over the many years since since the mid. The lake was actually built in 1963 when they first dedicated it. And then uh, and, and by the time I returned from out west, 
in 68, the day, uh, it was actually completed. And since that time, there's, uh, you've had all those years of uh, plastic that uh, everywhere the river comes and it takes a sharp bend, uh, the, the water is going to continue in flood time like we had the flood uh, back in, uh, Mr. in 2010. Mr. Francis, we need to move on. Could yeah. you please wrap it up? Okay, let me just, uh, just wrap this up by saying uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, I had one other thing I was going to say. I've got an article here in, in, a, in a newspaper that was written in, uh, in Smyrna in, in 1915, and it compared the uh, Stewart's Creek uh, to, the river, uh, to, the river, to the Nile River, and uh, it, it presented in such a way that uh, of, the, of the depth of the deep, uh, deep soil, the acreage that I, I have myself that backs up to the creek, uh, it, it's just, uh, there's scarcely a rock on it. It's all creek. And, and so Stewart's Creek, uh, my thought is by removing this dam, you could, uh, you could return, turn that dam to something like it was uh, back in the early days when my father lived in this area. And there, were, there was fish. There were very few fish that go past this dam right here. And, and, uh, and so my feeling is we're actually turning it to the, to, the, to the natural condition that it once was. And that would be uh, a pleasant thing for me. And I appreciate your allowing me to come today. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, we got a motion here, motion to approve removal of the dam subject to the approval of the United States Army Corps Engineer and no cost incurred by the Board of Education and agreement of being entered with the Cumberland River Compact providing for the division of the monies and credits with the Board of Education. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I've got a question. Just to make sure, because I know we kind of changed the agenda around and visitors haven't had a chance to speak yet. Just want to make sure that we didn't have any visitors that were signed up to speak about this issue before we vote on it. I do not think so. Uh, no. Okay, just want to be sure. Thank you. Uh, okay. All right, any other questions? Do we have a motion? <clears throat> Second. All right, Ms. Brighton, Tiffany Johnson. All in favor say aye. No. Aye. No. Any opposed? I'm opposed to. Two opposed. All right, motion passes. All right, let's go back to number six to the visitors now. And uh, first one on the list, uh, Ms. Laura Schlesinger. Schlesinger. Laura Schlesinger, Rutherford County Schools ELA and math teacher and president of the Rutherford Education Association. This evening, you will vote on the proposed hybrid plan that was in the developmental stages when we adjourned for winter break. While we appreciate the effort to reduce the number of students in our classrooms, our educators will continue to be exposed to the same number of students. Furthermore, excluding elementary students and educators from the proposed hybrid plan is unacceptable. Quite frankly, it sends the message that we care for some populations more than others. Safety for all is what is right and equitable. Finally, an added hybrid model will further fragment student and teacher focus and only add to the ongoing chaos, stress, and confusion of all RCS stakeholders. In no other district of which I'm aware is there a hybrid on top of an already hybrid model of simultaneously teaching in person and distance learners. Moreover, it is a misconception that incorporating our full-time distance learners into the proposed hybrid plan will help alleviate the need to support two groups of students at once. In fact, educators would more likely have to simultaneously serve 
are whopping three groups of students, traditional learners, distance learners, and asynchronous learners and their parents who are not in person on alternate days but have questions or are in need of additional guidance. Districts that have had success with a hybrid plan devote one day of each week, each week, to what we in Rutherford County have dubbed a distance learning flex day and have separate classes and sometimes separate teachers for their full-time distance learners. Fairly early on, we agreed that the hybrid model we have been operating under was not sustainable. Yet we are now considering compounding matters by superimposing a traditional hybrid model. On July 28, 2020, the Rutherford County Board of Education voted against a hybrid plan almost identical to the one being proposed this evening in favor of reopening schools with in-person classes and an option for parents to choose distance learning. Educators were given no such option. Supporting a hybrid approach to begin the second semester means you will essentially be asking RCS educators to implement two of three models originally proposed in July. We are not against implementing a hybrid plan as much as we are against implementing two learning models, which leads me to the third learning model. We have been told that we cannot afford to move Rutherford County Schools to distance learning. However, for the sake of the health, safety, and well-being of students and educators, we cannot afford not to be moved to distance learning until there is evidence of a consistent downward trend in the number of COVID-19 cases. Thank you for your time and attention. We consider you our advocates and trust you will make the best decision for Rutherford County Schools, students, parents, and educators. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Ms. Geneva Cook. Good evening, Geneva Cook, English teacher and vice president of Rutherford Education Association. The last time I stood before the board and spoke, it was to advocate for starting the year with distance learning. At that time, I had no experience in teaching during a pandemic, but now I do have that experience, and I'm gonna be real with you. It has been the most difficult year of my 26 years in the classroom. I've been very fortunate this year in that I've not been infected with the virus. or been a close contact of anyone who has been. But not every teacher has been so fortunate. <laughs> I've known numerous teachers in my building and throughout the county who have contracted it, no matter how seriously they have taken mitigation measures. They've had lingering side effects, a couple of which are extreme fatigue and brain fog, and I don't know how you come back to teaching if you can't even think. And as we are all aware, we have lost a bus driver, an educational assistant, and a teacher to this horrible virus. Excuse me. I've heard some say that teachers are using fear and anxiety as an excuse or that teachers don't want to work when the opposite is true. No matter if kids are in person or virtual, teachers have worked more hours learning new techniques and platforms to better help their students than ever before. And the fear of a rapidly contagious virus is smart. We should fear it. I know that a hybrid plan is on the table, teaching in person, distance, and asynchronous with part of the alphabet one day and another part the next. It will be exhausting and confusing to teachers, parents, and students. I will say that the days my school were all distance were the best teaching days I had last semester because I could concentrate on all the kids the same way. It was consistent, and I did not have to keep an eye on kids in front of me and try to engage those on Zoom at the same time. It is too early to have data on these methods of teaching, but as someone in the classroom who's been in the trenches doing it and who talks to teachers every day all over the county, I believe that it will come out that hybrid methods were the hardest. 
But if we must do a hybrid, then teachers must have an asynchronous day each week to make it work. When we were given asynchronous days back in the fall, where the students stayed home and we went to school and worked, we realized what a difference it made in our teaching decisions. We had time to construct valid, engaging, relevant lessons that really worked for all students. We were able to grade things in a timely manner. We were able to contact students who were failing or contact their parents without having to do it all at home. Teachers have worked hours and hours and hours at home above what we have been used to. I do see a light at the end of the tunnel, the vaccine. I want to be first in line to get it because I want to get back to normal. I want to stop thinking, don't go near that kid who raised his hand for help. Don't go to the teacher's lounge. There might be someone in there. You can't eat around someone else. And when Mr. Pettis Reed was talking about the dam earlier, I used to go to church with Mr. Reed, and I really respect him. And something that he said just suddenly was like, yes, Mr. Reed is right. When he talked about how even though that dam hasn't killed anyone and no one's been injured, you've got to remove it for safety's sake. And you cut down trees when they're too dangerous. It's the same here. Safety must come first. Why risk going back in person so soon after the holiday break when this surge is probably going to happen? And the vaccine is around the corner. I do not want to get COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Jacob Truex. Thank you, Jacob Truex, uh, Rutherford County Gifted Facilitator, Treasurer of Rutherford Education Association. I would also like to talk about the hybrid model and its implications for teachers and students. Um, I liken this model to what we've, last year when you had Thanksgiving, the year before last when you had Thanksgiving, sorry, everybody was at the same table. Okay. This year at Thanksgiving, half the family was at the table, the other half was on Zoom. What you're proposing is that we send, we have a quarter of the people at the table, a quarter of the people at Zoom, and the rest of them we're going to be writing a letter to at Thanksgiving. That's what the hybrid model looks like to me. We've been told that this is going to cut down on how many types of students we have, but really on, a, let's say, a Monday third period, we're going to have kids in front of us, we're going to have kids at home that are also working with us in class, and we're also going to have these asynchronous kids that we have to come up with something for that are going to have questions, that are going to need help. That's three sets of students instead of two. Now, Ms. Cook already uh, talked about how hard it's been this year to juggle two groups of students, and now we're proposing three. So, overworked teachers, we understand, but what about the students? Consistency. The students I have, they've told me that the worst time was when they were forced into quarantine, and the kids that have been at, at home all the time on distance learning have gradually improved. They started out fine, or they had some hiccups trying to learn things, but as time has gone on, they've been home, they've been gradually improving. It's the kids that have been traditional students who've been forced to go home because of that inconsistency, because of going home, coming back, going home, coming back, and quarantining that's been difficult for them. Um, now, when we go in on that third period Monday, and we're talking about teaching these kids in three different groups instead of two different groups, I just want to point out that at a school like mine, where we're on block schedule, right now, uh, traditional distance, whatever, we're doing 225 minutes of class per week. Now, when we go on this hybrid plan that y'all are proposing, it's going to go from 225 minutes per week to 90, because it's a block schedule. We're only going to meet third period once per week on the day, on the ones that have the flex day at the end. And so we're not even going to see them, but 90 minutes per week. And they're not going to be able to dialogue with us, but 90 minutes per week. And the rest of the time, they're going to be asynchronous or in your classes, right? Because it's a block schedule. So I believe for me, for my colleagues, for the students, that going full distance is the best way to keep safety uh, around. This hybrid model will still be exposed to the same amount of students. Uh, the students will still be, well, the, the students won't be exposed as much. The teachers will be exposed to the same amount of students, and they won't get the same 
level of education that they're getting currently. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is April Basham. Mm -hmm. Good evening. What I want to speak to is not specific to just um, the hybrid plan, but specific to how special education is not being taken into account when we're talking about virtual schools, regardless of whether it's hybrid or full time. My son and I'm sure many other special education students during virtual days are stuck at home without the full array of services or sometimes even any of the services that they that they receive in school as required by their federally mandated individual education program. As hybrids now up for discussion, more than half of my son's time will be spent at home without services. And let's be honest, how much of his services is he actually going to get in those two days that he may be in school? I guarantee not enough to offset what he isn't getting. Every day that he is spent in remote learning is another step back academically, socially, and emotionally. His grades have been severely impacted by increases in, in, in distance learning days. The second quarter, for example, the first quarter he had all grades above a C, passing all classes. In the second quarter, he failed four of his classes. His GPA went from a 2.8 to a 1.2, significantly less than half the previous quarter. However, since the two quarters are combined, his grade went from passing all classes, C or better, to now failing at least three of his classes with a 1.6 GPA, exactly half of what he was attaining before. What we are experiencing virtual, first, consistency is non-existent. Different teachers use different programs, and many use multiple programs. Before this year, my son had never even used email or social media or any other online program. Honestly, he doesn't know how to use these programs. And even throughout the year, he had never received any real instruction on how to use these programs and still struggles today. One week in person, one week virtual, one day here and one day there, no consistency. Not once while he has been in virtual had he received any of his IEP mandated one-on-one -on -one times with his inclusion teachers. For a child who requires additional instruction in the classroom, which is structured to go to zero structure and practically having to teach himself, no wonder he is failing. So his current outlook, we have damaged not only his ability to graduate, his GPA, his ability to get into college, but we've also um, caused damage in his mental progress. He is beginning to revert. He has anxiety and stress and depression, a feeling of failure, hope, uh, loss of hope and in this environment. So more than his academic future, I fear for his mental health. So what I'm asking is that you consider that select students within a special education program that meet certain criteria of which I would hope that participation of inclusion would be included, would be allowed to attend school in person every day, regardless of whether we are virtual, full-time, hybrid or not at all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on to number nine. <clears throat> All right, number nine is the, uh, the North Geographic Technologies. Through North Te 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 Geographic Technologies was utilized last year to begin the process of documenting our schools so they can be viewed virtually by our first responders in the event of emergency. This year, we propose adding four additional schools to continue this process. These monies were approved as part of the 2020-21 Safe Schools Grant and are now ready to be deployed. Motion to approve $49,920 for True North Geographic Technologies product. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right, do I have a motion? Thank you, Ms. Maxwell. Do I have a second? Mr. Estes, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Number 10. All right, before we get started, I'd just like to say there's no perfect plan. No perfect plan. Back in late July, when we started this process, one of the things that we said is we knew we can't 
control the, the virus, but we would need to mitigate the virus. How do we mitigate the virus? Well, it's pretty simple. First of all, you've got the social distance. What does that look like? Six feet away from each other or over, uh, you know, uh, maintain that distance for at least uh, throughout the day or as much as possible. Don't be in that area over 15 minutes, especially if you're not wearing a mask. That was another thing we decided to wear a mask. Does the mask prevent COVID? No, not all the time, but it's a proven fact. There's research been done by Vanderbilt University. It does mitigate the virus. I get it. Some of them, I don't like wearing them either. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I wear a mask not for my health, but for your health. That's why I wear it. I, would, I, I, I do not take pleasure of wearing the mask but I do wear it. The next thing I've heard that we, they were forced into quarantine. Nobody forces anybody into quarantine. Those are CDC guidelines that also that are accepted by the State Department of Health. So why are we quarantined? Because we're not, we do not have the ability to social distance. Back in the beginning of the fall semester, we started out with a traditional approach with options for parents to distance learn. 20, over 21,000 students chose to distance learn. Between the ending of the first quarter and the beginning of the second quarter, we saw a migration. And I don't blame, I, I do know and I respect some of the parents that expressed their concerns with with, with uh, the product, distance learning, but I think we've improved, but it wasn't to the standard that we expect. It has nothing to do with the teachers. It was a new, uh, a new uh, uh, foray into that uh, type of teaching, and it was difficult along the way. I think we did get better along the way, and I do want to applaud our teachers and our administrators for this first semester, but I go back to in that late October we started seeing more students coming back into the building. As more students come back into the building, you're going to have a difficult time to social distance. Now, let me get, get away from some, some theories. The virus does not exist in the buildings. It's brought into the buildings, whether it's a church, whether it's a grocery store, whatever, a department store, you bring it in the building. All right, as we went through, this is, this is what occurred over time in this first semester. We did a pretty good job. We had 22 schools and some of these double that we had to move to distance learning because not so much the number of positive cases, but because of quarantine. I said this several times, I'll say it again, 81 to 82% of all of our People that are out is due to quarantine, and later on, during when we talk about COVID leave, I'll let Mr. Baldry talk about how that's impacted us. So, as we see this, we have seen unprecedented. The thing that's happened is, is, is a worst case scenario with the number of kids coming back into school, with the weather turning cool, people going inside more we saw a increase in the positive rate of the COVID virus. Now, some schools were able to do real well with it. I'm gonna go through uh, some, some numbers here with you. Blackburn High School, we had to close it down, uh, switch over, not close it down, switch it over to distance learning twice. Now, a lot of that is predicated on how many people are in the building. It has nothing to do with black, Blackman's inability to mitigate the virus. They did a great job. They did the best they can. Oakland High School, twice we had to do that. Riverdale High School, once. Rockville High School, once. Siegel High School, once. Smyrna Alternative. We're talking about a school that probably didn't have 10 kids in there. We had to close it once. Stewart's Creek High School, twice. Christiana Middle, prior to even beginning, once. Laverne Middle, once. Oakland Middle, once. Rockville Middle, once. Rock, Rocky Fork Middle, once. Elementary Schools, Kittrell, once. McFadden, once. Las Casas, once. Rockville Elementary, once. Rocky Fork Elementary, once. 
Roy Walter main building once, Mern Elementary once. Now, you're going to be shocked when I tell you some of the reasons why we had to close the buildings had more to do with staffing than uh, the uh, virus, the positive cases. Not all the time, but a lot of the times. And look, we, don't, we can't control quarantine as much as we think this is a, being forced. It's not. This is, these are guidelines that we must follow. All right, now, how do we do that then? Well, then we thought, well, perhaps maybe we can develop a plan <coughs> where we limit the number of people that are on campus each day. Now, I heard this, and I'm gonna let Dr. Sullivan go over the PowerPoint here in a minute. I heard this, they have to do three different things. No, they're not. They're doing two different things. Okay, they're doing distance learning with those that have chosen distance learning, and they're doing the traditional teaching. That the, 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 the student that is at home is doing the asynchronous. Now, guess what happens the next day? They switch and come back in. So you're not, it, it's not like you're gonna not see them for a week. You're gonna see them for a week, all right? And, and we built in every, I think, uh, every Friday, is it? What, or every two Fridays, a, a flex day for our teachers where everyone do, does distance learning. Now, I will tell you this, this is not a plan that we wish, even if it's voted on a night and approved, this is not a plan that we wish to stay on for any length of time. We have, uh, in our motion, we have uh, proposed that if, we've, if this is voted on, we come back on February the 5th, we evaluate where we are, <clears throat> and we make decisions on if we stay on it or we go back off of it and go back. Has it been used? Yes, it has been used. I heard this, why K-5, why are they? There? Because if you look at the data and you drill down, younger kids are less likely to catch the virus. That's why, that's why we do it. We listen to the health providers. We don't draw this stuff up. Guys, uh, you know, this is not, look, whether we do the hybrid or whether we go back all traditional, whatever, we've got to understand that we're not your enemy and we're not, we're not trying to put you in a situation, you know, and by the way, Mr. Bill Estes, the bus driver, he was my friend. I went to the funeral home. Mr. Bill was 81, 82 years old, great man, sacrificed for this county. Never did Miss Sue ever blame this system of, 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 of harming Mr. Bill. We've got to be real, guys. This is a pandemic. You know, in, 20, uh, you know, in 1918, they faced the same thing. They face the same thing. What we gotta do, we gotta take care of our kids and our teachers and our staff. Our kids, not everyone has the same opportunity that in life. Some of our kids need to be in school, but they need to be safe and our teachers need to be safe. You know, one of the things, like I've said before, and I get accused of everything, I don't know that you can trace where someone caught the virus. I don't know that you can. I do know this, that the vaccine is on the way, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this with the board, but I'll go ahead and share it with you right now. I, I pulled up where we are in Lubbock County. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but Davidson County has 27% of their people, the population vaccinated already. That is uh, as of the 4th of January. Knox County has 27% of their population vaccinated. Hamilton County is 18%. Williamson County has 27%. Rutherford County has 15% and Montgomery County has 13%. These are some that we can count, we're similar to as far as a student, uh, student enrollment is concerned. I say all this is this is not, this, this plan that is not a stay on it all the time plan. It was used by Sumner County, they transitioned off of it. Once, once the numbers went down. So it's not the greatest plan, it's not. Personally, I think the more that kids are in school, the better off they are. Unfortunately, there's this thing called staffing. And I don't know how I can, I can, I can change that. 
we averaged about 52% overall in the district sub-fill rate. Now, before anybody jumps on our substitute vendor, uh, that's not their fault. Guess what Williamson County averaged? About 42%. So I say all this is when we come up and, and just listen to the plan, look, I'll be honest with you, my instructional department, we spent a lot of time on this thing, uh, and, uh, and I think it's worth going over and listening to. So Dr. Sullivan, do you want to come up? And... All right, thank you, board. Thank you, Mr. Spurlock. And so just a couple of things to reiterate, uh, hitting on what Mr. Spurlock talked about. Um, one, there is no perfect plan. If that existed, we would be using it, and we would have been using it since July. Uh, this very much is a plan that is in the middle. It is a plan from being traditional uh, to where we have all of our students in the building to being completely hybrid to where we do not have any students in the building. This is trying to make sure we have less kids in the building and still providing a traditional option. Um, so that is where this basically whole comes from. The reason we have such passionate arguments about both sides is because both sides are correct. Every one of those arguments that were mentioned today um, against a hybrid plan, uh, I can attest to exactly the same for those arguments. Every solution of why we need to do a hybrid to keep kids in person, I can attest to. I have one kid that does great hybrid and one kid that does great traditional. I've had that on a complete and normal level. So a couple things uh, about the reality of this plan. As Mr. Spurlock mentioned, it is not something that um, it was voted down and we decided not to go with it in July. Um, it was one that we necessarily do not currently love right now, but it is trying to keep us in person for our students. Um, as a district, Mr. Spurlock mentioned that we had 21,000 students that chose distance learning. Right before December, we are now at about 14,000, about 13,700 that are doing distance learning. So we have between 33 and 34,000 students who will come back to our buildings potentially next Monday. That does leave us in a concern because with our buildings, we know that we have many portables. Our buildings are often overcrowded and we have a lot of our students coming back. And so that was the whole intent for the hybrid plan was to try to limit the number of students there. We also have many schools that even in a traditional setting are using parts of their building, even though we have that square footage, cafeteria and gyms are being used for food, not necessarily for classrooms, so that we can attempt to socially distance. So a couple of things really just to, to point on for this, um, the whole real thing that the hybrid plan does is it allows us to better socially distance. I didn't say that it perfectly allows us to social distance. We have some schools that are still very much at capacity with traditional learners based on what parents chose. The other thing that it does is it keeps students at least receiving some face-to-face -face if parents chose that option. Again, it's not perfect, but it does provide that option to where kids are receiving that. What does this look like instructionally? It is very much a slower pace. Uh, we are in trying because, um, as Ms. Schlesinger mentioned, very accurate, and that's a worry and a perception that we do not want to cause any extra heartache or headache or work on our teachers uh, because they have done an absolutely uh, fabulous and phenomenal job this school year and in, in a situation that they really none of us could win. So we wanted to make sure that even on this calendar, you will see that if you are a distance learner, you are basically following the alphabet based on what, if you're in A through L and you're in sixth through 12th grade, if you're learning at home, yes, if you were a distance learner, you very well could have had a live Zoom lesson Monday through Friday, but to make this easier on our teachers, you are gonna have an asynchronous day in the days that your alphabet were not in person. And so that you truly would only have those two groups. You would have one group that was with you in person, the next day you would have a group, the other group that would be within person, and the other side would be asynchronous. So is that going to be a transition for our parents? Absolutely, because many of them are used to having that daily Zoom lesson every single day. Again, this is not a strong instructional model, but it is stronger than being completely remote. And that is where that comes down to. The other part we have to look at is we know that we provide a service to our community. Part of that is not just making sure we're providing students an opportunity to be successful, 
but also making sure that we are providing our community a chance to be successful. We do not have an after child care like other districts do, especially for our kindergarten through fifth graders. That is not something as a district that we offer or that we have. We have partners with YMCA, with Boys and Girls Club, but we do not have a department as a Rutherford County School Board to where we offer that child support every single day, kindergarten through eight or even higher. So about this contingency plan, again, knowing its pitfalls, we tried to make it as good as we could. Um, we took input, input from just about everybody we could find. Uh, we had 1,276, as of this morning, teachers fill out the survey. And from the survey, from meetings with our reopening committee, from meetings with our principals, um, feedback from some of you, we made different uh, modifications. At first, it was by grade band. We changed it to alphabet to be able to make it uh, more easy to follow. We then included sixth grade so that the middle schools would be on the same schedule. Originally, I do not believe it had any flex days. We added two flex days because you do have some holidays with Martin Luther King Day, and if it were extended, you have President's Day that would build in there as well to try to keep kids on an equal number. The other thing we did is we kept the days the same. So if you were meeting on Monday, it was not alternating to where you were Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then the next week you were Tuesday, Thursday. If you were Monday, Wednesday, you stayed Monday, Wednesday. And so those were some other modifications that um, we input into this. Again, this is just a proposal from the very beginning. What this board wanted us to look at was to look for a contingency plan. And that's what this is. This is a contingency plan for where we are with the virus, where we are with staffing in the building, and how do we try the best to mitigate the spread of the virus while also providing the highest quality instruction we can. So I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Can you help us understand the difference between a flex day and the expectations of an asynchronous day? Please. Yes, and so a flex day really is a day that we are still counting as an instructional day for, we have 180 days currently, that very well could change and that could be waived on January 19th in the Legislative Assembly when they meet to look at those. But as of right now, we still have a 180 day requirement that we must fulfill. So if we were to say that today is a day that we are out of school and we are not doing any instruction, there's another day we would then need to add from the calendar. We would need to take that from one of our holidays, from spring break, or add it on to the end of the calendar. Um, very much at the very beginning when we looked at different calendars, that was something that our parents and our teachers were, were not interested in doing in making modifications to extend the school year. So a flex day that we are doing right now, these distance learning days, are very much a time for our teachers to be able to plan and be able to work with our kids that need support. Asynchronous days then would be completely different and the workload would be heavier. And so your teachers in a perfect situation would go over on the A day. Let's take a last name A through L. You're in class on Monday, you are getting that instruction in person, or if you're a distance learner, you're getting it um, via Zoom or Teams, wherever you're using. You would go over what your assignments and what readings you need for the next day to do on Tuesday. And so you would do that on Tuesday. And then you would then, that Tuesday group, would get that live instruction, whether that's in person or via Zoom, on Tuesday, and they would be working on the asynchronous stuff today. So to kind of go back and look at the whole overall, our normal flex days that we have, those are days that really with interaction with a teacher, you would probably have with your school between an hour to two hours. Um, when we did those November 30th, I believe, um, and whatever, I think we have another one for March 8th, those are ones that the schools truly have tried to build in. We're gonna have an hour to two hours of here's what we're doing as a school, here are updates as a school, and then here are things that your teacher can have for you to check in for five or 10 minutes to give them time to plan, but also give them time to be able to check in with kids that are struggling. For these other flex days at the end, it would be very much asynchronous to where those would be activities that would be predetermined. There would not be live check-ins to allow our teachers time to plan. Again, if we did not call them asynchronous days, we would have to add them back on to the end of the calendar or take away spring break, one of those two. Thank you. Yeah. Did you ever make a, and I hate to make more work for the teachers mm -hmm. and the parents, and it's just, it's just awful, but did you ever think about going to seven period days instead of doing the block schedule? Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even in the best consideration, Agree. block schedule, it takes a while for kids to get that down. And, Absolutely. Um, 
I just didn't know if y'all thought of the students, you know, seven. We did, and we left that up to principal discretion to look at that. Many of our high schools did. I know a couple did not. Okay. Just because then meeting with their leadership teams, yes. In the very beginning, the transition is a big deal. That's one of the ways you mitigate the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry so much of it until you get into secondary yep. school, and, and that's when you have a problem. You're exactly right. And block schedule in a traditional year, we would have done a ton of in service training on how to even make a block schedule work. Because of the pandemic, that didn't happen. So, yes, absolutely. Just a couple of other things at the club before we go to anything else on, on this. In, I, you know, we were three weeks in school in, in, in uh, December. And in the three weeks that we were in school, uh, employees, we had 1,285 having to quarantine. We had 215 that tested positive. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, and it is. We've got, what, 5,000 and something, 5,300 employees classified and certified. So it is a lot. But once again, you go back to, and, and look, 1,200, almost 1,300 of them were quarantined. Students, uh, which we had approximately 36,500 on campus, uh, 7,392 of them were out for quarantine. 521 tested positive. So we, we see the impact of it. We really do. I mean, we see, uh, you know, quarantine's a huge, huge issue. Uh, you know, one of the things that the CDC did change here recently, and this is all only for staff and this is only volunteer. If a person, if a, if a staff member is, uh, you know, uh, caught up in a quarantine situation, if uh, they are symptom free uh, after the sixth day of being in quarantine, if they're symptom free, they have the option, if they choose to do so, to come here and schedule a uh, rapid test. If the rapid test comes back negative, they can go back to work. That is employees only. If they don't do that, if they do not uh, choose to do that, they can, after the 10th day, if they're symptom-free, instead of waiting for 14 days, if, after the 10th day, if they are symptom-free, they can come back. Uh, we really haven't had that many because it was we voted on it uh, real late in the semester. I think maybe on the last day, the last board meeting. But I, as I understand, we've got some employees already signing up to, to take the rapid test. Is that correct, Dr. Ed? That, that's great. So that's another positive thing. I mean, I, I think that will help quite a bit. When I go over these quarantines, you can see where the numbers are. Uh, you know. All right. No, we are we doing what? I'm sorry. Yeah. It was during the uh, visitors meeting. Yeah. I have a couple questions for Dr. Sullivan yeah. um, on the survey. Um, you said we had 1,276 that came back. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I know you sent us a copy of it, but did the survey have like a definitive question of Do you, those we, teachers whether yes. or not they supported the yes. plan? Yes, it was 59 to 41. 59 did, 41 did not. And so again, 59 supported, yes, they support a hybrid, 41 did not, 41%. One of the things that I've had um, actually several of our educators express concern to me about is the fact that this survey went out at the last minute before the holiday break and that they felt that perhaps that watered down our opportunity uh, for response. And I would have liked to have seen a, a lot more than that, obviously. So just uh, yeah. curious to hear you speak to that. I would agree. When this whole contingency plan even got brought for discussion the first time, that was on that Thursday, that we December 17th, I believe. And so the very next day was December 18th when we were tasked with coming up with a contingency plan. So the survey went the very next day as quickly as I could type it out the next day. So that is, was a way to try to get feedback. Yes, the timing was inopportune, but again, that didn't come up for discussion until the 17th, the day before. But I agree, I would much rather have a much higher feel rate. Anytime with a survey, you're happy with 10%, but that is not in our current situation. We want much higher above 50. I mean, we were at about 33, roughly, percent. Mr. Chairman, I have a, I have a question uh, for Dr. Sullivan. 
Uh, we had a guest who spoke about the special ed program and needs. Mm -hmm. I share in some of those concerns. So can you tell me what that's going to look like? Right. I hope that that is consistent mm -hmm. to every school and not at the discretion of a principal. It would be. And so where we were in the first four weeks, so the initial proposal was to have ESL, special education, RTI, all to be able to come in because those are our at-risk subgroups. We also felt like the first week or week and a half trying to get everyone used to a schedule logistically, we need to make sure we had the alphabet correct first and who was coming on what days before we then open it up for those schools to be able to, our students with um, served under an IEP with their contingency plan or ESL or even RTI because those are our kids that are below the 25th percentile um, and that's where I was a principal so that's where my heart is and looking out for some of our students that may not have other opportunities and so that was the hesitation is on Monday when we start hybrid, not only do you have all your hybrid students who are A through L, but now all you, you also have your students that have the highest needs coming and that extra frustration that may cause it to fail right off the bat. Uh, but absolutely that is the intent is to as soon as possible move that in. So our SPED students would follow the same hybrid schedule then is what you're saying? For the first week at least to allow us to start. Would there be an option for parents if they feel, I mean, Are, we are in a, ideal, yes. But I, I'm going to go on, Mr. Piggyback, mm -hmm. on what she's saying there exactly, too. And it was just heartbreaking to hear mm -hmm. that mom talk. And I, I wanted to ask her after she sat down, how, how old was your child? Was it high school, right. middle school? Um, I think I right. it's high school because she was talking GPA. Right. But, you know, you don't have to be CDC uh, to have some real problems. Mm -hmm. With, with, with this, and uh, uh, I was wondering, it, yeah. is it an option to those that, that fall in a certain And I'll tell you where part of that comes from is also making sure that we are serving their IEP in a correct manner. So to not just have extra things on our teachers. So if a teacher has an A through L group come, and they also have a student that is an RTI, let's just say, they are below the 25th percentile in reading. They are a last name of a T, and they show up on that first day that kid is going to, without the teacher having time to plan, they're going to be have the same lesson Monday and Tuesday right off the bat on that very first day we come back. And so that was why we wanted to have about a week to be able to transition so that our teachers would have time to be able to prepare what are these skills that these kids truly are struggling with and so that it's not that, because that's a whole different issue for parents, that's not helping a student just being exposed to the same lesson twice. Uh, we have to do something different if they aren't being uh, learning it from the first time. So, if I may, will you finish, Go Dr. Ahead. Sullivan, just kind of to tag on to that, but let's approach that question from the perspective of a child that mm -hmm. doesn't have an IEP or is not a SPED student, because I have had a number of parents that have reached out to me and said, look, we need our child in school okay. every day for various reasons, whether it's parent's work schedule or whether it's because that child, that the parent felt like that child was not benefiting at all uh, from the distance learning um, and were failing as, as this mom discussed, but it's not just the SPED students that we're hearing those issues from either. So one of the questions that's been posed to me by several parents is, I want my child to be in school every day. Um, is this hybrid, if, if the board were to approve this hybrid plan, does that eliminate their opportunity for that? It, I think we got to go back to the whole purpose of this plan. Uh, and, and, and I really want us to really sink in and think about this. The number one problem that we've had this fall is due to staffing. Without a teacher or without someone at least facilitating a learning opportunity, I, we're going to have to transition the school over to all distance learning. I mean, I, that, I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to create more staffing. That's, that's an issue. I mean, I, I, and I, I know. Like I said, I don't think the, I'm not taking any shots at our sub. I think they do a great job, but it's just difficult. We've actually had subs get caught up in quarantine, you know. So the staff, I think we've got to, and I, I, I agree with you, Ms. Moore, we, the, we need the kids in the school, but staffing is our problem. You know, that's our biggest problem. And, and, and I'm not saying this is going to, I, I will go out on record saying this is not going to create or not going to solve all issues. Absolutely not. But the alternative is, is how to, I mean, if someone can figure out how we can 
reduce the number of people in our schools at a given time, I think we probably would have a good shot. I think we show that. Right. Football. And we have students who are struggling even under the hybrid. My fear, of course, my position has to be over instruction. So regardless of my other views have to be, it has to be looking out for instruction. And so a big one of my beliefs is to make sure we're ensuring our kids are successful. We have to make sure that we give our teachers the best chance to be successful. And by having a model like that to where a parent could choose, that's, that's really what we were on the last night or the last semester was parents that wanted to send their kid every single day. Um, I'm in that boat. If I put myself as a parent, I have one kid that needs to be in school every single day. And so that would not help our teachers or our schools be able to mitigate whatsoever, which is again, while I know we have to provide a service to our community and part of that is for a workforce. And, and I, I do, I think kids, if they can, need to be in school. It's, it's the staffing issue. And, and I don't know if that's gonna go away until we end up uh, getting everyone vaccinated or at least it passes by. And so please know with whatever your decision is, this is just a contingency plan. So we don't take it personal whatsoever. This is the best of a situation we can try to make to propose a plan that took as many considerations and factors into account to where we, all of us want our kids back in school safely with our teachers safely so that we can get back to providing that instruction, the social emotional support. Um, and so I just wanted to leave that caveat. I'd like to say, this is the hardest decision I have ever been faced with in my life besides getting married and having children, the, you know, the obvious kinds of things. This past week, when I wasn't sick and ill at part time of, of the past week, uh, I have talked to parents and teachers and friends and students and everyone that I could think of that could possibly give me some kind of insight on what to do. What I would like to say to Mr. Spurlock and to Jimmy Sullivan is, y'all have done what we ask you to do. You have, I mean, I was one of the big ones saying, do something. I don't care what you do, do something. We got to protect these people. We've got to do something. You've listened to suggestions. You've met for hours and hours, and you have at least done what you, a good job. A very good job. So whatever happens tonight, know that we appreciate the fact that you have done what you were asked to do. One of the things we, no matter what the board approved, we're going to make it right for everyone as best we can. And, and uh, you know, I, like I said, I go back to the job that our, our administration, our staff, our teachers have done this fall. It's been, uh, it's been a great job and it's been a very challenging job for them. So whatever, uh, we're going to support, uh, you know, whatever the board chooses, and we're going to support our, our staff and our, our, our uh, teachers and, and our students. Mr. Chairman, yes. I, have, I wanted to just say a few things here. Um, I deeply appreciate what the director, uh, Dr. Sullivan and his staff has, have done. Um, you have worked effortlessly on this, and I am deeply thankful. Um, we've gotten a lot of good information, um, and this is a tough decision. I'll <coughs> echo what Ms. Bratton has said, but I have some deep concerns about this plan. Um, first of all, if I, and I, I got to make it real simple for myself, um, if we think about what our objective is, we're educators, that's what we do, we do education, um, and before the break, we were talking about how can we best protect our teachers. Um, I am having a really hard time understanding, and I've asked for an explanations to this, but my mind just can't wrap around. Just because we're moving our kids from one day to another day, our teachers are still being exposed to the same students just on different days. I get it, we're social distancing in a perfect world, but I've never met a teacher who doesn't lean over and help their student who's struggling or who doesn't stand at the door to welcome their students in. So I get things are different now, but I don't know what that looks like. And as a parent, um, I am deeply frustrated at the from school to school model. There is no real way to follow any of that. So some students in high school or middle school may end up seeing a teacher once a week on this plan. Um, I hope that isn't actually true, but 
it seems like it might be. Um, and then I, I guess it's not simple enough for me, and, and forgive me, I, I need more simplicity. I don't understand why our students, when, and maybe they, they are, and I'm just not getting it, I don't understand why our students who are at home can't jump on the distance learning, which it seems to be working, and then when they're in school, they can be on, the on this hybrid plan. So what I think Dr. Sullivan was explaining was on A and B days, they'll be learning the same materials. So if, like Ms. Moore said, if Johnny wants his, Johnny's mommy and daddy want him to be at school every day, then he's gonna learn the same thing Monday and Tuesday and then he's gonna learn the same thing on Wednesday and Thursday. That is confusing to me uh, as a, a parent and an adult and a human. So I, 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 maybe I'm missing how valuable this can be and I, I would plead with somebody to set me straight if I'm missing it. But if our real objective is safety and our real objective is education, which I have a child with an IEP. I've got three kids in school. Ironically, my child who has struggled his entire life is the most successful this year, praise God. Um, but I, we know that the virus is 10 to 14 days incubation period. And in a perfect world, we're all responsible and we don't travel and we stay home and we protect each other. But that didn't happen. We had record number of travelers in our airports. We had people up and down our interstate stopping at our rest stop. It didn't happen and no judgment. But, and I would favor a scenario where we extend our break, but simplify it maybe. Can we extend the break, do online teaching and allow our students and, and teachers an opportunity to do that quarantine, again, in a perfect world Everybody's gonna be online. Teachers are gonna do what, what they've been trained and they're gonna get additional support. You know, my concern with that, and I, and I, I know what, our, what our, uh, our mission is, and we know what our mission statement says, but we also live in a reality. There's a lot of our parents do not have childcare. And it's, it's a difficult task. I mean, I, and I get it, I, it's, I have to balance that. Sometimes when I get an email with a parent said, please, uh, you know, we, are, we have a, a small budget. You know, if, if, the, if my kid has to stay home, you know, it's, it makes a great impact. And I, and, I, and I get it because it is a huge, I mean, it, I mean, it's a lot. I know it's a lot on you board members. It's a lot on us because we do understand that there is this thing called life where individuals have to work and, and, and they depend on that income. And it may be a single parent income, you know, sometimes. But I do understand what you're talking about. If, if, if we don't do the hybrid, I suggest that we start January 11th. I, I agree with you that there is this thing called life. Um, but from the teachers that I'm hearing from, and not all of them, they too have a life. And I think we need to be mindful of, I'm all for traditional. I think kids need to be in that classroom every single day. I know I have kids that need to be in that classroom every single day and they've been quarantined and they've been traced. And this has been a very unfortunate situation across the board. Well, look, if I can jump in real quick, one week is, is not, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you understand, one week is not going to change that. That's, that's my concern. If we do one week, there's, you know, I'm looking at, I, and I didn't share this with you guys, prior to uh, the beginning of the vaccination, uh, there we ramped up testing here in Rutherford County. I think we went like several days over a thousand being tested. The more that was tested, the more came back positive. Since the vaccination, the, the testing has gone down, not dramatically, but maybe 300, that still sounds like, but it ain't when you're talking about our population. I don't see the virus where we are currently with 3,115 active cases. I don't see a fluctuation like that gonna change, perhaps maybe not until February. 
if then. And all of it's going to be predicated on the vaccine and some of the things of that nature. So I, I understand, I don't, you know, we, keep in mind, uh, uh, I think, was it Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday prior to Christmas break, we had all flex days where the teachers, they had Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We did that. Uh, even during that time, we had positive cases come back and quarantine come back. You know, we did. I mean, it didn't necessarily, like I said, happen in the, in the building. And we even tracked it over Christmas. We had 52, uh, I think 50, 52 positive or 52 uh, quarantine and combined, and of course quarantine was most, over Christmas break of staff. You know, so you know, they weren't in the building at that time. So my, my thing is, one week, I don't, I don't see that that's going to really solve their, our challenges. Um, you know, of course, that's to the, the board's prerogative if you choose to do that, but I don't see that solving our, our problem. But how, wish could, it would. how could it hurt us? How could it hurt us? Yeah. It, once again, that's another week that parents are going to have to sacrifice you know, I like I said, I, I understand I mean, that. I, and, and, I do. Oh, and, and remember, but how is it going to help us? Yeah. Well, well I, I can, I for one can tell you, my friends that work in retail, the kids are at the mall. They're not staying home. I would agree with you. Yeah. I, I, and the sales for, you know, I, someone who worked at Dillard's told me that they saw more people at Dillard's. They have a first day of the year sale every year, that they see more people in Dillard's that day than they had the whole entire holiday season. Ms. Sharp, so, let me, let me uh, retract what I said. I don't think all of them, but I think you're right. There's a large contingency yeah. of them. I mean, we have principals that are complaining because the kids are working yes, and they're not doing their school work. So I, I think the more opportunity that we give them to sit at home and go out, they're not supervised, um, is not going to help our numbers. One of the things that, and, and that we'll talk about this a little later about stimulus, the stimulus money that's coming, one of the big things with the, that, that we're going to be required to do is, is recapture some st loss of learning. Uh, we've, we've discussed it today. Uh, it, it, it ain't, it's not going to be waiting to the end of the school year. It's going to be as soon as we get appropriated the funding, we're going to, we're going to do some re remediation with some of our kids that are struggling. And, uh, and that's, when we're, that's a pretty, I mean, we, we have no choice to, to recapture that. But I, it goes back to what you said. I wish it was perfect, it was in a perfect world that everyone did what they should do. It doesn't exist that way. It doesn't. It doesn't. And I think it, even if we looked at the ones that chose distance learning as their option, some of them, and a high percentage of them, are our most at risk kids. Am I correct on that, Dr. Sullivan? Yeah, some of our higher poverty schools have some of our highest numbers of distance learning. I was surprised with that. Any other questions? <clears throat> I do have uh, one thing I was asked. Have we looked at if we did take an early summer break and take it now and go to school in July and August to make it up? I mean, June and July. It, that it would be, uh, I mean, we'd have to, I mean, I, I think you can, there's a, several things you can look at, but on that right there, you would have to do one or two things. Somewhere along the way, someone's not going to get paid. I mean, you know, you see what I'm saying? We, we've got classified, we've got certified, even certified. You would get paid for your 200 days, but I don't, you'd have, you might have to go a, a period of time without getting paid. I mean, I'm not trying to be flipping about it, but you know, that's, I mean, I, I understand what you're trying to look at, yeah. but uh, I, I'm, I don't, you know, I don't know about that now. I think we'd also run into different fiscal years with our teacher contracts as yes. well. Mm -hmm. I knew it'd be probably problematic, but I just wanted to. Well, you're, you're, we, would, we would go, if we did that, we'd have to uh, do like what someone suggests, we'd have to do all virtual because we would lose our ADM money for, for this fiscal year. I just had to ask a question. Yeah, sure. Chairman, I have one more question. Actually, and I will apologize to you for putting on the spot this question for you. As the president of the REA, 
you know, the feedback that you've gotten, because you represent a good number of the teachers in our system, the feedback you've gotten from your teachers, do you find the percentages consistent with what came back on the surveys? Can you elaborate a little bit how so? All of the teachers that Come to the microphone, please, so we can't can hear you. Thank you. Sumner County, they're doing the AB or they're doing, they are. Okay. So do they aren't doing distance learning as well? They're just doing the AB. some light on, on Sumner counties and I'll just uh, so I just checked our survey results just a second ago again and we're at 1326 and it's still 61 to or sorry 50 let me pull that right up. no so, the question is do you support using a hybrid approach to begin the second semester no we're 530 41 percent and yes 775 or 59 percent and I have the survey and REA, they, they're getting the same group of individuals, but a lot of times you're going to have both sides that are more boisterous about it. 
And so again, there is no right answer. But in talking about Sumner County, yes, Sumner County does have a much more robust virtual school. That is what we were trying to do with a virtual school. Sumner County actually can have our students in their virtual school uh, to where we were capped at the very beginning. Um, we're still capped. Uh, yeah, we are still capped, absolutely. Uh, they are not capped. Um, they have a, their own name, they have their own teachers. Uh, right. That unfortunately is not an option for us. Uh, we when, the state. state Department of Ed, when we, this was our first year for a system that's three times as big as um, Sumner County. This is uh, capped us at 612. We cannot even start, I mean, I had a conversation with the, the person in, in the State Department, we can't even start registering uh, to increase it because our thought process would we would add fifth grade. And uh, that's, the pro that's, that, that's the process. I still go back and I listen, Ms. Sessinger, to your, 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 your thing about they teach the traditional and they teach the distance learning and then they got the one on asynchronous. What would happen if, let's just, just imagine for a minute, that kid, uh, you know, A through L, those kids were absent that day. And then they came back to your class on the next day. I don't see that, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out that you're juggling three different things because the kids that are on asynchronous are gonna be back in your class the next day. And they're probably gonna go, you're gonna go over some of those things that, and get caught up with that. And, and of course, provide additional learning. So I, I really think, and, it, and it, it is, until you get down and work through it, it can be kind of daunting to understand it. But I will go back to the very beginning of this year and, and where we had traditional with choice, with, with parent choice. Uh, when we had 21,000, over 21,000 people going on to, uh, to our distance learning, we struggled mightily. These board members received tons, and this was before the new ones we came on board, tons of emails uh, concerning how uh, you know, challenging it's been for their kids and, and things of that nature. So I don't expect this, if, if this was voted on, I don't expect it to go off without a hitch. There's some things that he talked about uh, that we have to look at at some of our at-risk uh, population, but we've got to start somewhere. Now, if we don't, if we do not, uh, if the board chooses not to vote for the, uh, the hybrid plan, then w we have worked out a pretty good plan, I thought, for the most part. I, I thought we had worked out a pretty good plan. Staffing is a problem, and it probably will continue to be a problem. Uh, and it may, and quite frankly, I have to be transparent, it could possibly be a problem if we were on the hybrid plan. I mean, can we can't, uh, we don't have a crystal ball or, you know. Director, uh, could I just, I just on the, because uh, I care so much for our teachers. Uh, I just came out of the classroom myself. But how are we, I was very fortunate. I, I, I got out of, into town and I got a call from a teacher and said, get your parents over to Siegel High School on Saturday. And I'm very fortunate my parents got the vaccination. And we can't force anybody to take the vaccination. But how are we, what are our, uh, uh, what's the, the, the numbers of the teachers who are, are wanting to, to get the vaccine? And are those numbers, obviously you would think if those numbers increase, then the, it would mitigate the risk well, in the classroom. Of, yeah, one of the things, it, it, we, that's out of our control. It's all okay, I didn't local know if health there, department. They, if there was a local numbers that you could and, tell. And, and quite frankly, it won't be anything uh, that we'll say, hey, have you got your vaccine? They will open that phase 1B when they make that announcement for 1B to open up. And any, anyone that is in, 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 that's a public educator, works in education, whether you're classified or certified, you call the, uh, that number that's provided and, and they schedule your... I just didn't know if there had been, been some kind of survey of numbers of, of, of staff that were willing that said, yeah, we can get it, really I want it. I don't really think that would be appropriate. I, don't, I mean, okay. I, I'm, I'm, you know, if someone chooses to do... Okay, I'll personally tell you, I'll, I'll get the vaccine. Okay, I don't mind sharing that with you. I mean, I'm not scared of getting the COVID, but I'll get the vaccine if, it, if the opportunity comes to you. I just don't feel, I think it's a personal choice that, right. uh, that, that they have to make a decision on their own. And, and quite frankly, I can understand uh, some of them who may not want to get the vaccine. If I may, Ms. Maxwell, I did see um, a survey, I think that PET did it, and they, there was a large number that was going to receive the vaccine. They just didn't want it mandatory. Yeah, I'll, I'll I, don't for you. I don't want it mandatory. I'm not going to force anybody to, to take a vaccine, but 
Now, if we can only, and, and, and quite frankly, we got, a, you know, we had a conversation with the commissioner today or yesterday, I think it was, and, and the person from the state health department. Really, it's about the capacity. I'm not want to throw our, our health department has done a great job for us and they continue to do a great job for us, but it's really about the capacity. And some of the rural counties with, you know, very little population, but uh, have uh, effective health departments, they're able to get those quicker than we do. You know, that's just, just the facts of life when you, when you guys. Mr. Chairman, I have some questions for you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I, if I'm looking for you to make me feel a little bit more comfortable, give me a little bit more information about the online platform, the tools that we've invested in as taxpayers to support our teachers, the utilization rates, is this an effective short term opportunity for our students to learn? Um, and how are we, is there a standard that we're holding all schools to, or are we continuing with administration makes that decision? A big issue that we still have is we still do not have enough devices for all of our students. Um, in order for us to get enough devices for all of our students, quite frankly, we would have to go and ask the county commission for $5 million. Uh, that, that's not gonna happen. Um, that is, that would, and then you're going to look at how many devices are going to actually be delivered in time. That then takes into account our areas with, that don't have broadband access. It's not just we hear about Rockvale and Christiana. We have a large area out in Laverne, even by Laverne Lake, that closer to Percy Priest that does not have great broadband. The more we add that into our homes, the more their infrastructure is going to struggle. Looking at capacity-wise, instruction is not supposed to be digital. That's, that's not what good solid instruction looks like. Our teachers are not built capacity-wise for that. That's not how we're trained. Um, to say our platforms, um, I had that question from a parent today to look at our platforms. Why are we using, it was a middle school, 16 different platforms. If we take a middle school or a high school student who may have five or six classes, each one of their classes is gonna come with a textbook that has a, an app with it. So if we're just looking at textbooks alone, you have six. If the teacher has their own website, you now have 12. Now we have Zoom, which they need to be able to access, or Teams. They're gonna have Skyward to check their grades. And so we're already up to 14 just on the sheer, this is what they would have on, if they were in person on a normal traditional school year of apps that they're doing. And so when we are talking about how can we be consistent, part of that consistency is where we are using our vendors for our textbooks. And yes, I know that's frustrating. Again, I deal with it on my own personal kids and a third and a first grader have different vendors for their writing program and their reading um, and math. But part, again, part of that comes to where we are. Um, the things that try to be consistent are using Skywards where all of our grades are and then using Kidum or Teams. Um, and looking in to the future, we've already had discussions on looking at a different vendor for six through 12 for next year so that we can try to connect some of our assessment along with Skyward, along with a different platform to use 612. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? <clears throat> Well, guys, this is very frustrating for us all. I mean, it's a challenge that none of us wanted, but uh, we have to make a decision. It's, it's only fair to our Rutherford County school students and families that we make some type of decision here. And to be honest, <laughs> uh, I was not prepared to make a decision tonight. I, I wanted to come in here and listen to all the facts and try to make that decision. And it's still tough to make that decision because there is no right decision, but it's time for us to do it. Okay, um, motion to approve the proposed hybrid calendar for the first four weeks of the second semester and to move, uh, to, and to move, and we probably should have separated this one out. I don't know how that got in there, that's my fault. Okay, but let's move, let's move that one out of there. Uh, typically, well, let me go back to the report card. Obviously, this, this week we're doing all uh, distance learning, so we're not going to be able to provide the report card to them. Um, uh, motion to approve us allowing uh, Rutherford County Schools to uh, send the report card out on the 13th of the 14th, next week. Do we have a motion? 
Is this going to be a, this a, just to be clear? Just this, yeah, we're going to pull we're this just out. Just pulling this out and voting on it. Right. The, pulling this out of this, this should have been separate. Pulling the report card section. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, just pulling the report card out. I'll make that motion. I'll second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion all passed. All right. Going back to the hybrid. Motion to approve the proposed hybrid calendar for the first four weeks of the second semester and come back on February the 5th of 2021 to determine if we move back off this model as presented. Do I have a motion? If I may, I would suggest that this needs to be a roll call vote. Sure. Do we have a motion? Mr. Chairman, may I ask Dr. Sullivan one more question, please? Yes. Dr. Sullivan, if, and I understand it's not favorable and the virus is going to be here forever and ever, amen. If we voted to postpone for a week and do distance learning for an additional week, in a perfect world, 10, 14 days, I realize that's a hardship for families, but so is every other day in school in this flex schedule we're presenting. So. Would that be, would that give our teachers, in addition to the safety measures, would that give them time and space to breathe and maybe prepare for additional weeks? Would that be a favorable, um, productive period for our teachers and our administrators? If we knew where we were going after that week. That's, that's the big issue. Any time is great planning if we know what we're planning for. If we are planning to go back the way we were, then yes, that's going to be any time teachers can be able to plan is going to be favorable from a teacher's perspective. Um, I don't want to jump in there. I, I agree with you planning. However, logistical things, this is a challenge. This is not something you can uh, plan out because we've never been, been in this situation before. So I don't, I'm, I, to say that if we took a week to train this, Unless we were practicing it with kids coming in and out, I don't think that's going to really uh, help us any. I'm not, maybe I wasn't clear. I'm not suggesting like train and then let's get to the hybrid. I'm talking about uh, a little bit of time, you know, the 14, 10, 14 days. Um, I believe the kids need to be in school. I think they, they need to be in school. And yet I also believe that our teachers need some time. I mean, it's obvious. My, my family members have tested positive after the holiday season. They had family that was traveling. So I know that we have some issues we're facing. I'm suggesting that this isn't like a, a break for our teachers, but that they would utilize the time. Uh, for instance, my, my boys. Um, today, all of their teachers sent me an email. They had a Zoom meeting at a certain time for help, and you know all of this. So there is something happening. There's learning happening. There's availability of teachers to students. Could we not continue that into an additional week? Maybe the teachers have some opportunity because if they're not teaching all day long, and I don't mean any offense by that, I know they're super busy, but they're not face-to-face -face or FaceTime with kids. Can we? Ms. Ms. Johnson, can I interrupt, please? I'm the director of schools, okay? Uh, and you, y'all employ me. Isn't that the kind of conversation you, you should be having with me? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm asking more of an, an um, application question for him and his staff uh, I, I can ask you the same question I'm 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 asking whether his whether the capability of being able to learn and educate while affording our teachers the opportunity to do what they're doing this week in a sense of virtual week but with real learning and real Real, real learning. And I, my problem with the hybrid issue is that we're half learning. We're, we're partially learning and we're adding in. Right. We're adding in daycare issues for some families. Well, I mean, I talked to some middle school parents who don't allow their st students to stay home. So. Um, and I hear you and I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. My thing is, after one week, what's going to be different? 
Uh, that's my concern. After one week, what's going to be different? Uh, if it's, if I, I do see where it could be beneficial to the teachers, for a, but if, if it's, it's not going to be beneficial for them, they have to go through that process, because I'm going to be honest with you, that first couple of weeks of school this year was like, they did, I mean, you, could, you, couldn't, you can't simulate that on a, on a PowerPoint or none of that. And I'm hearing what you're saying in that one week. If you're saying, should we wait one week to see if the, if the if spike goes down? Essentially, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not a, I, can't, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just going by what I've heard from others that are in the scientific field and, and, and stuff like that, that probably we will not see this uh, dissipate to the point where we're very comfortable with until maybe in the spring sometime March or April or something like that. But we can't not, I mean, we do education, so we can't not, we can't, we can't continue down the same path we're going. Right, we, we, that's called a pandemic. We right. ran one, and uh, we, you know, uh, we, uh, we can't, the longer the kids are away from the, the classroom, the, the, the more challenging it's going to be to recoup that learning loss. And, and like I said, uh, I, I see the, I can see some benefits for, for some, of the, some of the staff, but I still say that until you get into that arena of what this is going to look like, you're not going to get the practical experience to become better at what you're doing. We've already got a misconception here about doing three different things at once. But that's true of anything that we do. And so I want to stay as close to what, what, is, what we can do. And you're absolutely right, we don't have a crystal ball. And again, I deeply appreciate all the research that has gone into this and the planning and the, the conversations, but the teachers I'm hearing from and the added, because we haven't done it yet, and the apprehension and the added perception of additional work is already overwhelming our teachers. And our kids, my son got an email today from a wonderful teacher, and it was an awful email. It was a preparation for here we go again. Mm -hmm. So I think the kids need to be in school. I know everybody agrees that way. I can't support a hybrid model. I mean, I respect that, but I also would like you to respect my consideration that one week, and look, one week is not going to solve the problems so you know and, and quite frankly we we worked on I mean I ideally truthfully I would rather us go to a hybrid for four weeks okay but I understand that if the board chooses not to do so then that's the way they're gonna do but I if, if that's the case I would like to get the kids back in with an opportunity if if parents want to choose we'll extend the opportunity for them to choose all distance learning and I, and I think that would be pretty you know that, I thought you guys did a great job choosing that in the beginning it's not perfect because and, and like I said the, the hybrid is definitely not perfect uh, it, it really and, and you, when it, you when you cut down and nuts and bolts to it it is trying to Keep staffing. It's just, you know, keeping keeping staff safe and keep them. And like I said, we go back to safe, but I'm going back to the quarantine also, and that's a challenge for them. I just I don't. I, I, the further longer that we prolong away from, you know, being a, an, uh, an educator for, uh, uh, for a long time, the longer we prolong them getting back in the building, whether it's you know, whether it's uh, all virtual or whether it's one week of all virtual, I, I think we're, we're, we're creating more challenges to us. So I just want to make sure I understand what we're saying. Our choices here are... Oh, the, the motion was... Hybrid. Hybrid, right. And the question that Ms. Johnson has asked, I just need to clarify what you've asked, is that if we added another week of virtual yes okay then go back the same way we've been going I, that's that's the yes. part i'm missing here that is that go to okay that's where i was getting to I, okay i just was having a little trouble we would have to turn this motion. i mean either this motion would have to fail for any kind of motion or okay 
first. Just, oh, gotcha. I just, I was kind of lost there for yeah. a minute. All right, I'm going to ask one more time for this motion. And this will be my last time. Do we have anyone that wants to make the motion? Okay, motion fails. Now you can tell, say it again. <laughs> I was asking questions, so okay. I, I'm, I don't. Mr. Chairman, can we take a five minute break? I know it's been a long meeting. Yeah, it's even going to be longer, but uh, yeah, we can do that. My <laughs> <laughs> <Not> bad. Okay, oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. There's a time and place for it. I know, I know. Think about that, the bus, the I, I, Hey, I, I understand it. I, no, I, I, no, 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 I, but I appreciate that. I just, know, I just don't think. I'm hoping that I'll think about what are we, my, my question, what are we doing? Thank you. 
I love her. I know. She's wonderful. Oh my gosh. She's yeah. a godsend for me. But she is she texts me all the time. She's like, oh my gosh. 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 She's like, Okay, let's uh, get our meeting back together, guys. <clears throat> Oh my lord. Bang that gavel, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay, guys, let's get back to business here. Mr. Chairman, I may have a question. It does, it looks like the hybrid thing is going to fail for lack of a motion anyway. Um, but I actually just had a teacher, um, not anybody here, actually asked me a question that. Uh, prompted a thought. Um, this hybrid system was designed for and was going to be rolled out for middle and high school, correct? Yes. So um, the question that was posed to me was what about the elementary schools? If we were rolling out this plan to protect the teachers and the students, how did that help our elementary school teachers? Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, even though uh, they can contract it, as far as the percentage, it doesn't occur. The uh, the kids, the younger kids. Now, even though it can happen, it, it's, it's a lot as uh, rare, I mean, it's not as seldom as, as the, the older kids. And, and quite frankly, uh, to be very transparent, uh, we know that uh, kids sometimes, if you, uh, you know, kids at home, uh, there's, there's a parent and, and there may not be a parent. All right, motion fails. We'll move on to number 11. All right, number 11 is the substitute teacher fill rate. Dr. Anthony? Okay, so our overall average for the semester is 67.2. You know, we started out in August hitting about 75, and then the national average is 40, 42, as Mr. Sprock spoke about. And so basically what they do is on the number that are, we get a report at the end of uh, each week, uh, and we, um, that, we can, that we can examine and look at. We have a daily report where we can do a five-day forecast. But basically what you do is you take the number that are uh, absent, the total number absent, minus um, those who are, where there's no sub needed. The reason why is because they're not being requested and they don't have the opportunity to fill that. So uh, basically that would be your denominator and then your numerator that you would divide into that number would be the number that you were able to fill. That way you could accurately uh, count to see what the percentage is. And, you know, many schools in different parts of the, of the district have a great fill rate, and then some do not. And it, that's why the, that average is 
um, kind of low uh, for both uh, November and December, uh, but overall we have a 67.2. Some, some schools have been able to uh, be creative on their staffing and utilizing our, our uh, cafeteria workers, which we're so thankful for them to help us as well. Um, so uh, that's, that's our first semester average, and uh, many of the school districts, uh, Knoxville today, you probably saw they were in chalk beat, um, panicking kind of how they were going to handle school uh, without their subs, They're, and they were hanging right in there with us on uh, sub numbers. So it's, it's still a big uh, issue across the state. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. Is there any plans to try to ramp up and get any uh, more employees? I assume that's their issue. They just don't have enough employees to... Yes, uh, we've been talking also with MTSU. Other universities allow like a, a substitute internship deal that would be paid, which would be basically the salary for the subs, you know, either the 130 uh, or, or basically the 80. Uh, range uh, if they don't have their license, depending on if they have a license and how long they are, are doing that time, if it's at, you know in more than 20 days. Um, right now, Miss um, Lucier, who is uh, at MTSU over the education department, they do not have a course such as that. But um, I've also asked her to uh, talk to the other departments to see if maybe they could put it into their uh, access. If there's somebody that maybe perhaps. Um, have not majored in education but would like to go into the area or, or that they're curious about going into education. You know, we have many teachers that sometimes wind up in the business field and then they uh, go into teaching. So uh, we're looking to see if we can branch out maybe to other uh, departments other than even the educational department. On this December report here, I'm, I'm counting 22 out of the 49 schools were less than 50%. That's right. That, that's correct. That's correct. You've got your Smyrna and Laverne in, like we were saying, it tends to be a harder to fill. Um, probably exception, Smyrna High, 78% fill rate. So you, you, you've got your exceptions, of course, uh, uh, but mostly in the Murfreesboro and the Eagleville area, very easy to get the Yeah, I'm looking at Christiana Middle on, uh, on the, for the month of sure. uh, December, three weeks, and I see the total number of absences is 107. Of course, the not required, no, no sub required, mm -hmm. uh, that is 18, so you take that away, and there was only 54 over the course of those three weeks, 54 were actually filled, so mm -hmm. 90 of unfilled. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, that's the big, that's, that's reality right there. Sure. Now, one of the things, uh, you know, I, and I think, Dr. Anthony, I had a conversation how we want to uh, kind of change how we're recording this. I think, it, correct me if I'm wrong, our vendor, uh, uh, it, it, there's differentiates between the request after seven as opposed to... The way that they've always calculated and as well as PSG is that seven o'clock a.m. fill rate um, uh, but also, when they give us our reports, they tell us you know, if they've been getting calls after seven or eight, or how many are considered emergency. You know, the, the the teacher winds up waking up sick, and then uh, or they have a sick child, and they don't know that till that morning time. For instance, like you mentioned, uh, Christiana uh, Middle, uh, they had um, I think during the month of December, it might have been. I'm trying to see if I can find the line. Twenty looks like twenty five. Um, those type of emergency and those emergencies happen yeah. a lot when it comes to COVID and so that also exacerbates that feel right um, you know that challenge when schools are started and maybe perhaps by the time everybody's able to enter that type of leave um, the day has started could we do this mm -hmm. could we extract after seven and and then combine them also and have two different pieces of data because sure. to me, whether they put in at 8 o'clock or they put in at 5 o'clock in the afternoon the other day, if I don't have a staff member there, to me, that's absent. Mm -hmm. So could we do both of those? Sure, and we just right. wouldn't be able to compare it to previous years. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What is the age requirement for a sub now? Uh, 21, um, as, as it is for a PSG, but they're looking at, uh, they've had some interest with 20-year-olds, um, especially at the college level, 
trying to decide if that really is their career field. And um, they've proposed interviewing those people specifically to check for maturity and to make sure that they are you know, able to handle um, those kind of requirements. Uh, so usually it's a uh, best practice for sub-programs to do the 21 and older, but they are seeing that the availability is coming up now for mature uh, 20. So they're looking at that. Could we also look at 19? Um, there are some 19-year-olds sure. that are mature enough to, to probably do the job also. It would probably be on a case by case. Yeah. If, if that company, they would have to check to see if that, how that affects their coverage and liability as well. Yeah. But they are uh, open-minded to uh, those who are looking to be going into the education field. They feel like the, that the sub uh, system can be a support for the school system and maybe help them to find out if that is their, you know, true calling. Normally, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'll go ahead, Ms. Moore. Normally in most staffing industries, they're considered an adult at 18 mm -hmm. for insurance purposes. So I don't know that it would really be viewed as any different. And, and I think it's a great idea to explore it. And I'll give you, somebody said 19, a perfect example why. I've got a 19-year-old that's very, very responsible and mature and loves to work with kids and would probably do a great job with it. So he has another job, but just using that right. kind of as an example. I do have one other real quick question, though. They talk about the vaccine distribution, and I know that the teaching profession, at least from what I understand, is going to be prioritized um, next in line, at least after the health care workers. Is that going to apply to our subs as well, as far as availability for vaccines, or do we know? Yes, it should. That's what, we, what, what our understanding at this time is, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm done. I, I want to make, uh, let you know that I appreciate this because, and I don't want to disparage... Um, this, this vendor here, this uh, sub vendor, because they have gone above and beyond uh, the call of duty. They had some issues themselves, I think. Yes, and they have also, out of their own pocket, to help to promote, they've had their own incentives, and they have spent um, almost $20,000 just for the months of August through December trying to do the extra bonuses. And um, the nice uh, ladies that has helped us over the past years, um, Rosie, uh, and Janet, we lost Rosie at Christmas time uh, due to COVID. And so, um, you know, it, it's a, a member of your family, you feel like, after talking to them every day. And so they, they have uh, put their heart and souls in it. And so they're actively looking for an additional recruiter right now. And, and that's what I'm trying to say. I, I, you know, I want, I want to be like the NFL and fire them after a pandemic year. You know what I'm saying? I, mean, I, I think they've done a, as better, uh, just as gr a good job as you can do in these circumstances. Mr. Spurlock, if I may, uh, talking with friends and other people who own their own businesses, uh, even Amazon has been, I mean, you know, you used to get something, you could order it at 7 o'clock at night and the next morning have it delivered to your home. Um, so not necessarily COVID, but just like us, the cases for quarantine and everything, that's, that's across the board. It's across the board. And where, you know, the Christmas holiday season, there's a lot of people that would jump at the chance for a job for $20 an hour. Uh, they, I know I've had people that have even account executives that have had trouble filling those positions. So um, I, I agree with you. It's not staffing. Well, just please keep us informed. And if we can add any tools to their toolbox, we'd be glad to do that. All right, moving on to number 12. All right, November 10th, 2020, board retreat pay. It has been requested that the board consider whether, uh, whether or not it deems the November the 10th, 2020, board retreat as a board meeting mandating board member pay. The retreat titled School Board Academy Planning, a joint venture, was hosted by the Tennessee School Board Association. Board members received $75 stipend for attendance from the state uh, of Tennessee in addition to credit hours towards training during the retreat. The board did conduct business in that it performed a review of the director of schools. However, historically, the board has not received pay for retreats. Uh, recommend motion, the board recommends motion to vote to determine how to classify this retreat for pay purposes and may also choose to determine the status of the future TSBA retreats. Any questions or discussion? Um, I find it really very curious, actually, and, and I guess a bit troublesome that this is even being debated or that it's even on our agenda for a vote. And I think 
we're kind of going down a slippery slope here saying that the board can vote on whether or not we get paid for a meeting. So I just want to kind of backtrack a little bit. Mr. Reed, if, if you would come up, because I've got a couple of questions for you. First of all, um, this was a joint meeting. Um, we did have TSBA training, but we also had what was a publicly noticed, correct, um, agenda meeting that the press was able to attend. So there was also in, in this language of the motion even indicates that it was a meeting where the board conducted business. Um, a stipend is very different from a board meeting uh, or a pay, excuse me, if you will. Um, I know that there were a couple, Mr. Reed, you and I had conversation back in November and I know that you and the chairman did as well. And you had even sent me an email, I believe it was on the 29th of, email, um, 29th of November, indicating that it had been decided that this needed to be paid as a meeting and that Ms. Hopkins had been instructed to go ahead and submit it with payroll. So I guess really my first question is why almost, a, well, more than a month later, is this coming back up as a concern? I, I, I apparently have missed something here. And I don't know, maybe Mr. Young's the one to answer that, I'm not sure, but. Well, it was brought to my attention that we'd already been paid by TSBA. And since I've been on the board, I have never known us to be paid for a meeting by TSBA, and then also by Rutherford County. So that threw up some questions. Should we get paid or not? I don't think one person should make this decision. I think it should be the board that makes this decision. Should we receive pay for a meeting one meeting that we had, uh, yeah, there was, we combined some things in that meeting, but should we get paid by two different entities? Okay. Um, well, first of all, if you look up the definition of stipend, that's not paid. A stipend, as a matter of fact, is not taxed. It's viewed as, and if you look at the actual definition, as um, reimbursement for expenses, which in all the experience we've had attending, um, TS based sessions in Nashville, you know, that was the way it was always presented, that it was offered to board meetings as a, board members as a stipend to off, help them offset their travel expenses and their meal expenses. So there is a, a, a definitional difference between stipend and pay. Um, but again, it even says, and I, I'm confused by this last part of the sentence, the last sentence too, it says, however, historically the board has not received pay for retreats. Um, I've been on the board for six and a half years now, and Mr. Young, I, I know that you probably remember that for at least the last five of those years, I have pretty much done everything but beg other board members to consider doing a true retreat because I felt like we needed it for planning sessions. There has never been a quote unquote retreat done since I've been on the board. So how, I'm not sure where we came up with this. Historically, the board has not re received pay for the retreats because there haven't been any. Uh, we have had evaluations before, and that was part of, of this retreat that we had at this time. So, and did we ever get paid for evaluations? Or I think it's always been with during a regular board meeting, hasn't it? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I if I may, and um, appreciate Miss Moore's comments here. I actually was the board member who requested this um, meeting. And although we call it a retreat, it's actually called a school board academy planning, a joint venture uh, sponsored by the state. Um, and we all earned our continuing education, which this, the board is required to do seven hours of uh, once a year. So when I set this up I, and, and requested this meeting, had no intention of this being at the expense of the taxpayers. Uh, and in case our taxpayers don't know, um, school board members are paid $500 for the first meeting and $250 in a month, each additional meeting. Uh, we used to be compensated for committees. We no longer are. We voted against that. It's also why we've eliminated work sessions. Uh, I've got some more information on that if anyone's interested. In the school board, uh, Tennessee uh, School Board Association continuing education pamphlet that we get every year, um, which the, the board and the taxpayers typically pay for these courses for us, this is an item in there. This was not considered a board meeting. This was, we could, ha we had the option when we set this up to either do this at a local hotel, which would have cost the taxpayers, 
or we would have gone up to TSBA uh, a little north of Nashville. But for convenience purposes, um, I requested that it be done here in our boardroom. I, I think that we set a, a precedent when we make a decision here, call it the retreat or whatever you want to call it. We are being, this is, this is an educational component. This is, and yes, we did review the director's evaluation, but that was the whole point of this whole situation anyway. It was to understand, and we had the welcome, and yes, the press was notified, because if you remember correctly, Ms. Moore, we had had some meetings scheduled previously, and because board members, more than one board member or two board members were gonna be present, we had not properly notified the press, and so to prevent open meetings violations, we have decided to post all of our meetings when two or more board members are gonna be present on our website. So this agenda was, we did exactly what we were supposed to do that day. We did not have a board meeting. We didn't bang the gavel. We didn't keep minutes. This was not a board meeting. Did we keep minutes for that? I don't believe we did. I appreciate your input, Ms. Johnson. Uh, it, it was indeed a meeting, though. It was accommodation. And Mr. Reed, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you and I have had a couple conversations where you expressed to me that you had also expressed to the chairman that you thought this was a meeting that needed to be paid. Is that correct? Um, I do believe it was a meeting because you did do long-range planning. You reviewed the director's evaluation, so there was business conducted that day, so there was official board business done. So I do think it would constitute a meeting with respect, with respect to state law. You know, I will add that um, for the benefit of everyone's just knowledge and for people who may be watching on TV, you as board members do not set your own compensation for, for meetings. So you don't have control over that. That's governed by state law and the state legislature has adopted a statute which provides that um, the county legislative body sets forth how much board members get compensated for attending meetings. So you really don't have complete control over your own compensation at meetings. Um, and I think the goal that the state legislature in doing that was to create uniformity among the counties with respect to how this is handled and set up a procedure where you don't have boards of education having to make that decision on their own for themselves to pay them or not, because that's a very difficult decision to make. Um, so the way the state statute reads in 49.2-202, board members um, legislative, their pay for meetings are set by the county legislative body. So that is set by the county commission in our case. So that's how that is determined. You, do, you, do not set, you don't even vote for that as far as how much you, get, you are to get paid per meeting. Oh, but it, again, going back to my question, I mean, you indicated to me in a conversation that we had that you considered a board meeting that should have been paid. I think it was a board meeting um, because you did long range planning, which is a core activity of the board. And you also did the, you reviewed the director's evaluation, which is normal, which is, is a duty of the board to do as well. I, I, I appreciate your point you made about yeah. us not determining our, our pay. Um, and I acknowledge that, I, forgive me for not including it. We do set our own schedule though. Um, and case in point, if, if I had known that this was gonna cost the taxpayers and it's, only, I mean, it's a minimal expense, obviously, but it's, it's more of a principle for me. I never intended when setting this up, nor is the information that's provided by TSBA, would I ever recognize this as a board meeting? Um, we did not collect, we didn't keep minutes. We never gaveled in or gaveled out. We made a public announcement because the board was gonna be gathering and the evaluation because of the contention on this board was, that was the intention of that meeting. So, um, I'm, I'm deeply disheartened that we're even having a conversation about us board members having to have $250 more in our paycheck. Um, our teachers don't get to decide if they wanna take extra days or, I mean, this is kind of ridiculous to me, so. And I would agree with you on that, Ms. Johnson, but as I said, I found it very curious and I, th I think I know the reason why this has all come out. And it's also very troubling and concerning to me that we were asked to vote on this via text message a couple of weeks ago. So, um, but again, Mr. Reed, it, you know, and I understand that, that, you know, for whatever reason, you don't want to give me a direct answer, but we did have the conversation and you did tell me on a couple of occasions that you felt like this was a board meeting that should be paid. So it's not ridiculous, Ms. Johnson, it's a matter of principle and a matter of policy that we conducted board business. I would agree it's a matter of principle, Ms. Moore, but I do not believe 
based on the information, disagree with Mr. Reed, forgive me. Hmm? I did not set this up with the intention of us collecting as we were attending a board meeting. It was not, it's, it's an educational opportunity funded by the state. So if we start doing that, then does that mean every time two of us board members attend a TSBA meeting, it's considered a meeting and now we're gonna be compensated of for that? Of course not, time? that's ridiculous. I mean, this was not just a TSBA meeting and that's my point. It was an entire day meeting and Mr. Young and I even had conversation in advance where I had made a special request that it be done on a Saturday because quite frankly, I was not in position to take a day off work. Um, and we had a lot of conversation about that. Mr. Young, I know you shared with me that apparently Dr. Grissom was not available to conduct the meeting on a Saturday. Um, so, you know, if this was the decision or it's not gonna be paid as a board meeting, that should have been determined up front. I guess what I'm gonna do is ask legally, what should we do here? Should we consider this as a meeting that gets paid or? Legally, um, state law says if you meet, you are to get paid. So if you have a meeting, you get paid on that. You get paid for that meeting. So that may not be right or wrong, but that's what the law, from a legal standpoint, purely from the statute, whatever the per, whenever you meet, you're to get paid, and the per diem that you get paid is set by the county commission. And again, Mr. Reed, would you agree that legally a stipend is an entirely different thing from a paid meeting? Uh, uh, or you stipend want. is different than compensation, yes. So I'm confused. What was the stipend for? The TSBA stipends are designed to reimburse board members for expenses that they're normally out of pocket for these meetings. But we weren't out of pocket. Well, no, and I was quite surprised, actually, that we got the stipend from the TSBA since we held their portion of the meeting. So we returned here. the stipend to the TSBA is what we did. Because I've been paid. I never cashed it, but I've been paid. So if we're going to be paid for the meeting, then we should return our stipend. I would be fine with that, but I don't know if that's something, again, that would be... If, if board members want to return the stipend, you can return the stipend if you choose to do that, yes. I will say this: a lot of this issue is ah is, is not you, one that you normally incur in a year because normally you have this TSBA seminars in Nashville or other places. But because of COVID going on this year, the normal TSBA training that you would normally receive as board members you have not received. So as a courtesy, TSBA offered to come do that here for you as board members here in our county at your office. So. So the normal expenses that you have, would have had traveling somewhere else or for lunch or whatever, for gas and mileage, you know, were, was not there. That, um, that those are the type of things that stipend is intended to compensate you for. So it's only because you're in a, a weird year because of COVID has this issue even come up. So it's not one that would normally even come up. Well, and frankly, the TSBA stipend that they pay, I've always thought was a little bit too much for folks in Rutherford County, and I think probably at the end of the day that the number that they decided on was designed for the fact that we've got board members from all over the state that travel to Nashville for those meetings, and obviously their out-of-pocket expenses are going to be more than ours. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, you know, it's supposed to cover travel and, uh, you know, lunch expenses and that kind of thing. So. Yes. Mr. Reed, uh, for clarification, this was not an exception because of COVID. This is a course that is offered through their pamphlet for training for boards. In fact, Tammy Grissom recommends that we do it every year or that boards do it every year. It was a team building exercise. We, we visited the roles of the board members and anybody who came or people who were here. This was not an exception to normalcy or in place of anything that we've done before. And so then my question to you would be, if we had done this up at TSBA, we still would have put it on our calendar, but if we had a different location, would we still be having a conversation about compensation? If you had a, if it was a TSBA training session, I would not think it's a board meeting. So if it's just a training session that you have with TSBA, that would not, and you conduct no board business, that would not be anything the board is entitled to compensation for. You don't conduct board member. Board so members. yeah, the training sessions, no board, no board business is ever transacted that I've seen. But are you talking about the board business of reviewing the director's evaluation or going, uh, or is that what I think the board business was twofold. I think one, reviewing the director's evaluation and doing long range planning. And we would not have, we would not have done that if we'd gone to a TSBA event. We didn't do long range planning. 
We talked about items, uh, how we could work together. We looked at the director's evaluation. We did not put together an evaluation format for the next year. We did no long range planning. There were goals that the board members talked about that day about long range goals that everyone would like to see the school system achieve. So that was one element of what you guys did that day. I would like to make, I'd like to amend the motion myself. <clears throat> I'd like to amend the motion that uh, we receive board pay minus the $75 stipend. And then return that additional 75 back to the TSBA. Right. Do we have a second? Oh, wait, say again. We, we get the 250 but minus the 75? Right. The, your, uh, Rutherford County is just going to send that to TSBA. Are we? We go ahead and get paid 250 and then we send the $75 back. No, we, it's minus the $75. Let the Rutherford County send the $75 back to TSBA. My only concern about that is, and I, I appreciate the recommendation, Mr. Young, but I think, again, because a stipend is not considered pay and it's not taxed as such, we might get into some tax ramifications from doing it that way. But Mr. Reed or maybe even Dr. Anthony, speak to that from a payroll tax standpoint i think if you want to go that route you, everyone the board members just need to return the 75 stipend dollars voluntarily if you choose to do that and just have a flat compensation based on what the county commission has approved for meetings um, for the school board if we return the 75 do we lose our educational credits i would not think that's up to tsba to decide but i would not think you would lose your educational credits All right. So any other motions or? So are you going to reward it to Mr. Are you going to amend it? Then, or I think we need to clarify the actual language of the motion. OK, so I'll let Mr. Reed just repeat what he said there. Uh, okay, so um, if I heard what uh, direction this thing was heading, I think the motion would be to um, deem the board retreat a board meeting for which you will be compensated as normally under the um, county commission rules. And the board members should return the $75 stipend that was received from TSBA to TSBA directly. Okay. So that's the motion. Do we have a second? All right, Ms. That should be a, that should be a, board, a board member needs to make that motion. I can't make a motion. Okay, I'll move. So. Okay. And I second. All right. Mr. Chairman, can we have a roll call vote on this, please? Ms. Hopkins. Mr. Estes? No. Ms. Johnson? No. Ms. Bratton? No. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Ms. Maxwell? Yes. Mr. Young? No. All right, motion fails. Are there any more motions on that? Any other motions or? Here's the thing, Mr. Mr. Young. There are several of us that have other jobs. I know you're included. And historically, for board meetings, we, ha we have been paid. And to Ms. Moore's point, she had asked for a Saturday. Um, this was in November. I took off because I was going to be compensated. Um, if this is going to happen in the future, I just request that because you did ask for 100% mandatory attendance. Correct. So in the future, if it's not mandatory or that we're not going to get paid for it, then we need to know up front so we can make those decisions, just like our teachers make those decisions for their households and their home budgets. As a single mother, I took a day off from my other job and because I thought it was a school board meeting. So historically, we've been paid for that. I would ask that you give us that courtesy. 
I will do my best. <clears throat> I just have one more question for you. I know it's already been voted on, but I'm just curious from a legal opinion, a legal standpoint, if this were to be challenged legally, what do you think the result would wind up being? Um, I, it's hard to speculate what the results would be. I've, already, I've given you my opinion that I think the board retreat was a meeting that day. So, um, because board business was conducted, I know it's hard to remember all, everything has occurred a few weeks back, but um, the elements that were done that day, we had the board, uh, the director's evaluation that was reviewed and discussed, and we also had specific goals that were discussed about long range planning um, goals that each individual board member had for the board in the upcoming year. And there was a substantial debate, a discussion about that for a period of time. So both of those are board, uh, are board duties under state law and constitute board business. So thank you. I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure it goes into the minutes and on record that we're not following the advice of our board. Thank you. All right, number 13. All right, if the board will uh, allow me, I'd like to just dispense with going through the uh, information on the policy since we've gone over it once and once in a meeting and just simply read through the policy number and uh, recommend, make a recommendation at the end. Okay. All right, policy 1.83, tobacco and vape-free schools. Policy 4.400, textbook and instructional materials. Policy 5.202, separation practices for non-certified employees. Policy 5.302, sick leave. Policy 5.304, long-term leaves absence for professional personnel. Uh, policy 6.200, attendance. Policy 6.303, in interrogations and searches. Uh, policy 6.402, physical examination and immunizations. Policy 6.411, student wellness. Policy 6.503, homeless students. Policy 4.209, alternative credit options. Policy 4.6051, substitution for PE credit. Policy 5.3031, leave for religious observance. Policy 3.405, contracted bus service. Policy 4.401, textbooks. Motion to approve and adopt the above reference policy changes on the second and final reading as presented. Okay, any questions? All right, do I have a motion? Brad, do I have a second? I had Mr. Estes over here. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. This next one is an emergency policy adoption uh, to policy 3.400. It's recommended for emergency adoption on one reading. This policy is an emergency due to the need to cover routes that have gone abandoned due to driver shortages and location uh, and due to COVID-19. Ms. Uh, Page, would you mind pointing out what part in, in there is, is, is anything changed? Or? Yes. Oh, would you mind yes. that? Yes, absolutely. Since our last meeting, I've been working intensely with Heather Scott, who is here with us. Heather represents the contractors, or a good portion of our bus contractors. So over break, we went over the policy that you all saw at the policy committee meeting and made some adjustments. Some of them are just language changes, uh, maybe taking some of the recommendations we made and giving them some more teeth to them. One example uh, that Ms. Johnson has asked for that we've been able to come to an agreement on as an example was that previously we require for a contractor to participate in that first priority list, which you'll see that language on page three. It had to be that the person drove for the district for two consecutive full-time years. Uh, we've had proposed that that be changed to two consecutive full-time years or the equivalent. And as you can see in this example, we're able to work with our contractors to find a middle ground. Um, the contractors originally proposed uh, to remain uh, consecutive, but to allow for those part-time drivers we have that maybe have to maintain other employment while they drive uh, to have an opportunity to eventually be contractors with us. So that was a ch uh, one of the changes we made. Another one that I will tell you, I want to make sure that you all are aware of this as we head into the conversation. 
On second priority list, our historical practice has been for the second priority list to restrict contractors to only take up to six contracts. If that would have been originally on line three of the fourth page. Uh, we proposed as the district to remove that maximum entirely to allow our contractors to take as many contracts as they were comfortable to take. The motivation for that, of course, being that we're only seeing, unfortunately, less contractors in the business. So if we can get more routes covered by the contractors we've had, we'd like to do that. Uh, the contractors, uh, after I sent this uh, policy to you all and indicated that there was no objection, they did express a thought that I'd like to share with you out of fairness. Uh, they did say that they'd like to see that maximum remain, but change it to 10. Uh, and they, I'll, I'll, if they'd like to speak, I, you know, and you all want to entertain that, that's up to you. Uh, but the reason is that they don't want to see a monopoly of one contractor taking up the business and maybe pushing out some of our more, um, our smaller contractors in the business and some of the community uh, partners that we've had for a long time. So that's something that they'd like. That's up to you all and whether you'd like to add that today or if you'd like to reconsider that in the future. This is a policy. At any point, you all can change that. And we can also consider if we wanted to look at uh, limiting that, we could also look at putting that in the contract. So there's some options if that is something you want to consider. Uh, from your assistant superintendent, Trey Lee, he recommends not adding it. Uh, but I want you to know that the contractors have a different position on that element. Some of the other changes that we went back and forth on is whether or not exchanges should remain uh, barred, which, which was we, what we proposed. We're ultimately able to come to a compromise on that. Uh, I think we all see some benefits and some disadvantages, but one of the things we were able to do to try to meet the contractors halfway on that exchange language was to give some more specifics about when they could get that a, a, an exchange approved. So we wanted to make sure that they knew that they, uh, the director of transportation does need to communicate with them and get their input prior to making a decision. And gives and uh, Heather did a great job laying out some factors for him to consider on what might be a good reason to allow two drivers to exchange routes. <coughs> so those are some of the major changes. Really, our goal overall was to was to keep the process that we have most of the time. Most of the time, the process works. <coughs> fine with some tweaks. You know, I think we've all seen some issues with some dropping routes and things like that. But the main purpose of this was hopefully after COVID it won't be a problem. But just for the odd chance that we end up in a situation again like this year where we have routes due to uh, contractors not having the capacity to cover them based on their location and because of the shortage of drivers, for the first time really that anyone can remember, we've had contracts go unclaimed. So that third priority category is really the main driving mechanism for the district's proposal, uh, district staff's proposal of this policy. Like I said, we hope that in the future this won't be needed, but what this third priority would do is if a contract uh, comes up, maybe a, a contractor unfortunately falls ill, goes out of business, whatever it may be, can't cover the route anymore, um, and no one wants that route, that contract would be offered to all contractors and folks who don't participate in our list. Any person who is eligible to drive, that contract will be offered to them to take rather than having to go one person at a time due to the time that takes to go through each individual contractor. With more than one were to ask for the route, we would break that tie on seniority. So whoever's driven with Rutherford County longest, they would get the route uh, if they asked for it and maybe a, a newer contractor also requested that route. Those are some of the key differences. We did do lots of small language tweaks uh, from what you've seen, but a lot of that was really the contractors giving some good input, I think, on how the lingo that they actually use and the things they look for when they operate. So I also, they are here, so if you want to hear from any of them or from uh, Ms. Scott, you're more than welcome to hear from, from them. But I feel like this was a, as much as I can thank them, they have been so cooperative with me. Um, and it was a, a, hopefully a good omen for our negotiations as we go into our new contract year. And I'm very thankful for their input and patience with us. Right, motion to adopt the above reference policy changes on first and final reading as an emergency policy. Is there any discussion? Any questions? Mr. Chairman, I do have a question um, for Ms. Page. Can you, uh, forgive me, can you go back over this 
the request for the max at 10. Absolutely. We can revisit this later. I, I would like to know more information about from both sides why. Yeah. Why yes, why no. Sure. So from our perspective on the reason I did not put it back in uh, is that we're looking f as quickly as possible to get our routes covered as quickly as possible. We have students right now who don't have uh, consistent bus services. And that's not at the fault of the contractors that are here in the room. It's really the circumstances we're all in right now. Um, the hope would be that if we don't see, and Mr. Lee and I have discussed this, we didn't see where our place was to limit someone's ability to do business in the county. If they wanted to expand their business up to a higher number and they were able to competently provide those services and we have kids getting to school, we were fine if that was from one provider. Uh, at least what's expressed to me, and I'll allow them obviously to speak to themselves if you want to hear, uh, the counter -argument, that, argument to that is that it could have uh, someone with more resources come in and take away the business over time through attrition of getting tons and tons of contracts, preventing future providers um, from getting into the game, if you will, and also limiting the providers we have now who maybe don't have the same resource pool of someone who showed up. So it's really about business, whether we want to restrict business um, at, from our perspective um, through a policy. I didn't think we wanted to get into that. I felt like we had made choices in the policy to increase the opportunity for our contractors to make their own business decisions, and that's why I wanted to take that out. Um, but I do see their concerns, and I think it's fair for the board to consider. Historically, and as I think Clarissa told me as long as she can remember, and that's usually my litmus test, uh, it's been six. So we've had it at six for a very long time. So I do know that that's something that they're used to having. Um. To clarify, this is not something, this would not be something they would address through the contract process, would it be? We could. Policy. This is policy, so we've had a lot of things that we've had to decide where it should go. Uh, typically, my test is, does it impact our kids? If it impacts our kids in this board's ability to fulfill their statutory duty to get kids to school, I think it should be your policy. If it's something that's related to business, it can be negotiated. So it is a potential in my mind that if Heather and I wanted to discuss putting a limit on how many contracts they could have in their contract, their master contract, that is another option we could do. Um, the fear, I think, if I'm being trying to put myself in their shoes might be, what if you choose to enter into different contracts with different providers? Because they are individual companies. Um, they have a representative here today, and they have a body that represents about 70% of them, but there are 30% out there that are not spoken for by Ms. Scott. Um, and at the same time, there's still individual contracts with each of those providers. So th there would be some fear from their perspective that if we chose to contract differently with different people, that we still do have that power. I appreciate that, and I, I know we're in a different season now. I just want to make sure that we can that I understand fully and we can revisit this at a time that... Absolutely, and if we wanted to add this to policy, you can either do it today by motion if you disagree and want to have that max, or we, at any point, if you'd like me to bring it back, uh, we can bring up a policy at any time. If you just let me know, I'll add any, I always add any uh, policy you all ask for on our policy committee meeting, and we will have one in the spring. So we could, if we wanted to talk about what a number might work for the board and for transportation, we could have one in place if we wanted to set a cap prior to our contracting that would be effective July 1st. I can see the concern, but I mm -hmm. think we're in that place right now. We have a need, and so I think maybe we need to continue this conversation. But I appreciate the information. Absolutely. Did I hear, Ms. Page, that you said that we'd have a meeting in the spring? We will. I have not set a date yet. I'm on the bus committee, and I have never been notified about any meetings. No, policy committee, Ms. Okay. Maxwell, well, and you'll be notified. Just but like I haven't been time. to any bus committee meetings either. We haven't had any. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had any because of COVID. Do we have a motion? <clears throat> Mr. Justice? Do we have a second? Ms. Bratton? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, number 14. Number 14 is facilities, TDS equipment, right of entry for equipment installation. TDS telecommunication has submitted the first new access easement contract. Engineering instruction would like the board to authorize Mr. Spurlock to sign this agreement and all future agreements. Let me stop there. We might want to put director of schools in there with Mr. Spurlock. Okay. Let me go back. Excuse me, guys. TDS tele Telecommunications submitted the first new access uh, easement contract. 
uh, engineering and construction would like the board to authorize the director of schools uh, to uh, sign this agreement and all future agreements for equipment uh, easement access for, to TDS. That's Laverne in the northern end of the county, right? And yes, sir. Miss Miss Sharp, you, you, did you get the question answered about that? I'm pretty sure he was busy today. Um, I had asked Director uh, Spolock, was TDS or is TDS the only service provider that we have? Because living on the north end of the county, on any given day, on any Laverne or Smyrna Facebook pages, you can see parents complaining about TDS. We have no choice. TDS has the northern end. They have, they basically have from the Smyrna Laverne city limits to the Davidson County line. So it affects Rock Springs Elementary, Laverne, and the Laverne schools is affected by this. And we do not have a choice. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, do I have a motion? Move to approve. Ms. Johnson, a second. Ms. Braddon, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Number 15, insurance update. No updates at this time. All right, number 16. I'll try to get through this quickly. First of all, we'll start by letting Dr. Anthony recognize one of our strategic goals of meeting it. And if you could give us a brief overview with this emphasis on brief. Yes, so one of our goals was to help to ascertain um, which teachers, which administrators can provide the greatest impact for our students for growth. And so we looked at the Power School candidate assessment. And so that's up and running now. And uh, great feedback from that, and the, all the principals can see the results. And what it really does, it, it tests on the areas that we talked about last fall when we were looking at it. For teaching, it, it, it tests about their cognitive abilities, their testing skills, their ability to handle multiple situations. And then the recommended score is a 50 or higher. And uh, we are seeing that the principals are using those, and we've had great feedback, uh, no negative feedback at all on that. It gives them another tool because uh, also when they click on that link, it gives them access to questions to ask on the interview to bring out their strengths and areas to reinforce and helps them assign a mentor at their school based on those needs. So it's a deeper drill and in and, and, and this time and day it was a lot on their plates so that helps them a lot. And then uh, we are rolling out um, the uh, administrative candidate assessment because we're going to start a new academy uh, this semester. It's going to be our future principals academy and uh, it's going to be a small group of uh, current APs who have had at least two years of experience. And then uh, Dr. Sullivan and I will be providing both the instructional and the management side in addition to uh, instructional rounds with, with um, principals who are already in our district uh, in addition problem solving solutions and different scenarios for them to work on and uh, projects. So we're really excited about that and uh, plan to um, put the application out for those APs uh, this month. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Uh, the next information we want to provide to you is that uh, the stimulus funding that will be coming our way, uh, we anticipate some around in March, uh, quick turnaround there in terms of getting this taken care of. Uh, we are going to get, uh, for the state of Tennessee is receiving one, or will be receiving $1.1 billion. Uh, Rutherford County Schools projection right now, we got $4 million in the CARES Act. We are hoping to get $16 million. Uh, initially with the CARES Act, we had the equitable services that we had to take care of, uh, and we end up recouping all that. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Brodery? That's where we shared with private schools. With this one, there's no equitable services, period. Okay, so it all comes to Rutherford County. We have met already and gone over some things. There's some buckets that uh, they're wanting us to use this uh, funding for, and we will bring it to you at a, a, a very quick time so that you can vote on this. But here's some of the things. Learning loss, that's one of the, one of the big buckets. Uh, deferred capital maintenance as it relates to COVID, which could be a variety of different things. Um, also, uh, also on this is we are going to be able to, we think we do right now, right now, and I'm going to let Doug mention this very quickly, 
about how it can help us recoup something we've already spent. Okay, Doug, you want to give us a brief overview there? Yes, sir, very brief. Um, we have, we've expended several million, um, close to five, between five and six million dollars to date for specifically just COVID costs. Obviously, we're going to go back to utilize this funding to recoup some of that cost. Um, one of the things that we that that we incurred an expense on was, of course, the the federally uh, mandated COVID leave. You know, through that, that was authorized through the CARE Act. Um, we um, we to date have incurred one million two hundred twenty four thousand twenty six dollars fifty four cents in emergency leave payments to our for our employees. Um, the substitutes for for those that were quarantined to date, $226,352.28 for a total of $1,450,378.82. Um, that combined with the $1.5 million that this board approved for a transfer of funds to the cafeteria fund to, to, for cash flow to make payroll, um, you can see very quickly we're going to get to around $6 million that we, and once again, I'm, I'm, I'm it, it is growing daily of the cost of COVID to Rutherford County School System. So this is a very welcome, you know, news that we're getting this, this second round of funding. While we're on that topic of the COVID leave, on December the 31st, at this time, it doesn't exist. And you and Dr. Anthony explained to me what is, what is our plan going forward? Yes. Um, with while the while that uh, was it five six thousand page document that the the Congress passed, it included this much needed funding. One thing it did not include was an extension of that of that leave, that emergency COVID leave for for our um, employees. So going forward, because obviously we're still in the middle of a pandemic, um, what we would do, what, what we're proposing to do is is since this was not this leave was not re renewed, how we would assist our employees should they be quarantined for COVID would allow them to have these options. Number one, they could telework if possible, and the employee wishes to and is able. Number two, if they do not want to telework or work is not available for telework for them, they can obviously utilize their regular sick time that they have accrued. Um, Employees that do not have sick time and they have uh, are participating in our sick leave bank, which we had open enrollment for three months this fall, they could then, of course, utilize the sick leave bank for paid leave while they quarantine. If those all three of those options are exhausted, the employee then could um, they could file for unemployment. <coughs> which of course was increased under this, under this new bill, um, federal bill that became law, they could file for unemployment during that period that they were quarantined because no work available. And once they came out of quarantine, be it the 10 days, 21, they would then come back and, and we would bring them back to work. But that allows our employees to have options should they become quarantined going forward and with the loss of this, this leave that the, the federal government had. Okay, the next thing uh, we've all heard and read uh, about what the priorities as far as education is concerned for the, uh, for the Governor Lee, uh, this, uh, this emergency meeting they're gonna have here early starts this dialogue. Just to go over some things, uh, first thing is to hold us harmless is for BEP funding. That's, one, that's a big thing. The next thing is to increase the instructional component of the BEP. That's a, that's a, a veiled way of saying we're going to give you more money, you put it to teachers. Now you can call it a raise, uh, but a lot of that's predicated on uh, how that works is you, uh, with that funding you can use for offset cost of the insurance. You can, you, you can split it that way and, and so forth. I would caution you teachers and let you, educate you on something. We've got over 400 uh, positions in the EP that is funded fully by Rutherford County government and taxpayers. 
no money from uh, the uh, the state. So just keep that in mind. So that's that's uh, that's a big thing when we start talking about all of the, the you know this funding coming forward and stuff like that. Accountability. They will be taking that up in terms of holding harmless the teachers, the schools, and, and the districts in terms of accountability. Learning loss, like I stated earlier, that's, that's a huge one. And the last one is literacy. Now, that you've been hearing a lot of stuff about, um, what is it, um, READ 360. That is only optional if you want to do it. It's not mandated, but the literacy that they're talking, that we've been on this for several years here. We seem to change like the wind blowing. We go from one thing to another thing. Uh, but, but that's what they're talking about. The last thing I'm going to let uh, Mr. Lee mention something about energy conservation. Yeah, we talked a couple of months back. Y'all authorized us to go ahead and do an RFP for an ESCO company. Uh, put together a committee. want to give you a quick update. We've put together a committee that's going to share that. It's Mr. Beaudry, Ms. Page, Mike Walls, um, myself, and Lynn Pater. Uh, we were on review number three. I'm hoping to have that completed this week. At, your, at our next board meeting, I'll present you with a copy of that RFP. It's about 60 pages long. Uh, for your review, uh, with the request that we'll be able to send it out, for bids, and I'll have a schedule in there for you of when we send it out and how the process works. But at the next board meeting, we plan on having that for y'all's review and approval. There's, there's one more other thing that, Mr. This is very important. It's about revenue stream, and I, I'd like Mr. Bodery to, uh, to mention that. I know this, the hour is late, and I will be very brief, but it is very important. You haven't what I placed in front of the course is your, your, monthly, your monthly financials. If you will, just look on this first page, and we're going to discuss briefly down on the revenue line item 40162, which is payments in lieu of taxes local. I also have, I had placed at your, de at your, at your desk this copy of it's, the re it's a resolution from the city of Murfreesboro. It's resolution 20R05, establishing payments in lieu of taxes for the Murfreesboro Electric Department for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2020. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you about briefly is the payment in lieu of taxes from the Murfreesboro Electric Department, okay? If you look at your financials, you'll notice we have budgeted $970,000 for that line item for payments in lieu of taxes for this current fiscal year. That is the budgeted payment from the uh, Nashville Electric Department for some of the presence they have in Rutherford County, and it's for the Murfreesboro Electric Department. That's, you see my budget line, that budget for that line item is $970,000, that's conservative for a regular year. Now I want you to go to the very next column where it says zero, okay? The Nashville Electric Department makes their payment in lieu of taxes at the end of each fiscal year. So that's coming. However, the Murfreesboro Electric Department makes their payments through the entire year. As you can see, they are not paying. What happened was in July, this July, of this current fiscal year, the, the, the sale of Murfreesboro Electric became final. And at that point, they stopped paying their payment in lieu of taxes to not only the county school system, but the city, their own school system. We did not receive notice. No one in this, no one in this, my office, nor I had received notice, neither did the county finance department. I checked with the finance director of the county. They did not receive notice, and she told me neither did the county trustee. I understand this was a city-only sale that they were selling the electric department to Middle Tennessee Electric. I wish they had been able to at least tell us that that was going to end. Now the issue, and once again, I went and looked at the video of the meeting when they voted on this, that the city council voted on this for this last fiscal year, payment in lieu of taxes to the school system and to the, and to the city school system in the city as well. I watched that, that meeting. There was not one mention by the city council that this was gonna end, even though they were in the middle of negotiations for the sale of that electric department. 
They did not talk about it ending. They did not talk about it changing at all. I, and I understand it. We're looking at, I, for that payment for Murfreesboro Electric, that payment with taxes, I was budgeting $934,000 in that line item. That's gone. That's, to, to wait that, that's over a penny on the property tax. It just came out of my budget. In the middle of a pandemic. Now, with a 15% share with us. That's, that's the, yeah, the 15% share is, we're looking about, we budgeted around $850,000 on a penny, so that's over what a penny was on the, for school's purposes. Now, lo losing revenue is enough without being notified. I have an additional issue, and that's why I'm bringing it up to you as well, is because I included that in our local maintenance of effort so we get our BEP funds. I do not make maintenance of effort now. So what I'm asking the board to consider is so we can receive our BP payments and we do not have some of it impounded and put in a BP reserve at the end of the year because of this loss of revenue from the city, um, is that you would, you would request the city of Murfreesboro Council to do a one-time annual payment to this school system so we can meet maintenance of effort. And for all I know, there's city school systems in the same boat. I don't know if they included that payment to their city school system for their BEP fund. <coughs> I'm just trying to take care of us. If you would please, you know, do a formal request to the city, Murfreesboro's council, they can do a contribution. They can do an amendment, do a contribution to the school system from, from city funds to make us whole so we get our BEP payment and we meet mates of effort. If that, if that answer from the city is no, and I will be back next month to, this meet, to the meeting, and we're going to have to speak with the county commission about additional local revenue for this current fiscal year so we can make maintenance of effort. So I'm assuming that our county commissioners didn't know about it either. This just was all kind of a... It was a... I, I'm not going to assume anything, but I would say... I, I would like to say yes because they're, they're the finance, the county finance department didn't that did not know that. So I would assume, I hate to say that, but I would assume that yeah, no one at the, on the county side knew this. Like I said, this was a city specific deal, but I wish they could have at least notified us that this was going away because this this payment lower taxes has been a long term payment years for decades from the city of Murfreesboro to this system. So is this something we need Mr. Reed to draw up for us uh, to make the formal request? I just, just a formal request, I'd appreciate it if that's what you want to do, sir. Reed. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Number 17, TLN, Ms. Bratton. Yes, I have spoken to Senator Reeves several times in the last couple of weeks, and he was kind enough to send me yesterday the entire agenda that was going to be covered on January 12th for their special session. He, um, and much of it, Director Spurlock has already gone over, the learning loss and the BEP, so forth and so on. Um, I did ask. Senator Reeves, if anyone would be able to attend that session, and he said no, there were no visitors at all able to attend, but it would be live stream. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what Director Spurlock said, but I had one thing that I thought that you all would really think was interesting, and this was the enrollment impact on local budgets. The negative impact of enrollment on local budgets could also be an issue for the special session, as school districts have experienced a drop in the number of students attending due to the pandemic. Such enrollment declines can reduce funding levels for the 21-22 school year, and legislation could be considered to hold district funding harmless. So, you hear that, Mr. Boder? <laughs> yeah, so that, that would be great. Um, they're considering several things. He mentioned BEP. 
some STEM programs, vocational ed, competency-based education, but it, it's quite an agenda that they're looking at, and I do have it. If anyone else would like for me to send it to them, I'll be glad to. Thank you. All right, uh, federal relations. Ms. Yeah, I, I was going to discuss much of what Mr. Spurlock has already touched on with the federal funding. Um, I appreciate the numbers of how much the district is actually getting. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting in the news covering this funding package was uh, the money allocated towards choice. Uh, it was noted in the president's, one of the president's speeches, I think, that um, because 50%, some 50% of school age students were not afforded the ability to go to in-school, uh, an in-school option, they are going to funnel money to afford that choice, which to me is very scary. Um, and it, it, I think we need to be mindful of that and speaks to kind of what we did tonight. So um, just part of what we're going through, but that, I found that to be quite interesting. Thank you. 19 general discussion. Any discussion? All right, before we close out, I'd just like to say, guys, I really appreciate your sticking with us and, and uh, fighting through this meeting. I know it's tough on everybody. I really want to thank our frontline people out here. We've got a lot of our bus contractors here tonight. Those guys are out there on the front lines every day getting our kids to school. And uh, we've got a lot of great employees here, a lot of great staff. And uh, you see them out on the street, thank them, because we really appreciate what they do. Nothing else? Meetings adjourned. <laughs>